Okay, welcome to the November 1st, 2016 meeting of the Sammy City Council. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Mayor Don Jaron. Present. Deputy Mayor Romero Valderrama. Present. Council Member Tom Hornish. Present. Council Member Kathy Huckabee. Present. Council Member Bob Keller. Here. Council Member Christy Malchow. Present. Council Member Tom O'Dell. Here. East Lakes High School Student Liaison, Tyler Zengagbia. Okay. Uh, Council Member Malchow, would you lead us in the pledge? Indeed. We had some disconcerting news today, and no. Deputy Mayor Valderrama, would you like to speak to it? Yes, it's uh, my sad duty to inform everybody of the passing of Senator Andy Hill. Oh. Andy Hill was a good friend and mentor, not only to myself, to Sammamish, but also to the 45th District. He was a great leader. In fact, I had often said that he was probably the only irreplaceable leader of both houses that we had out there. Uh, he will be sorely missed. And I would remind everybody of Stuart Scott's quote, when you die, it does not mean that you lose to cancer. You beat cancer by how you live, why you live, and in the manner in which you live. Thank you very much. Here, here. Thank you, Romero. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Hill was a, a good friend of Sammamish and actually in one specific case, he came through for us uh, when we were dealing with Klahani issue. And we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of Issaquah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he was a great, a great person, worked across party lines and uh, will be dearly missed. Yeah. I, I should say our best wishes and condolences go out to Molly and his family. Okay, uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Are there any changes? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? By your vote of 7-0, the agenda is approved. Next, our presentation of proclamations. Mr. City Manager, do we have any? No, we do not this evening. Okay, student liaison report. We're waiting for you. Well, good evening to the council. Hope you're having a, a good start to November. Um, so I'm Tyler Zingaglia, I'm with Eastlake High School. Uh, I'm the public relations uh, representative from Eastlake. So I want to talk about uh, the biggest thing that we had uh, last month, which was our, our homecoming uh, for 2016. Um, I sort of talked about our planning stages last time, but uh, we decided on the theme of growing up together. Um, and this may seem like sort of an interesting theme for, for a homecoming dance, uh, but the way that we like to do things is to put a lot of intentional efforts into what we do. Um, so the Growing Up Together theme sort of encompassed um, all of our students in a growing school that's, that's really big, um, sort of where we all came from, but now that we are all at Eastlake, we're all a family there, um, and we're all a community. So we sort of celebrated that throughout our homecoming week. Um, so we started back, started our week um, bringing back the old stuff. So we brought back um, things like goldfish, like crocs, um, sort of giving people the chance to bring those awesome things back from the past. Um, and then ended the week with focusing on our futures um, and what we're looking forward to. Um, our seniors going off uh, and then an awesome homecoming dance on Saturday, which was, was really great. Um, and it's cool to see how our efforts throughout the week um, resulted in that dance. So that was great. Um, we also have our Veterans Day coming up, so we're, we're working on uh, planning an activity for that and a way to, to highlight those people at our school, which um, we do take a lot of importance in, and so we're, uh, we're excited to do that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we have going on at Eastlake. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about old stuff, you should be talking about hula hoops and Bobby Fox. <laughs> 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 I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, for public comment. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, next is uh, public comment. And do we have a list? And this is an opportunity for the public to address the council, three minute limit per person or five minutes if representing the official position of a recognized community organization. Um, please be aware the council meetings are videotaped and available to the public. So first is uh, Lynn and Donna Luquist. Okay. Can you hear me okay here? Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lynn Lipnitz, and this is my wife, Donna. Uh, we have a little bit of a personal history we'd like to share with you. Um, oh, we're close there. Uh, okay. On, on the, the walk I'm walk, showing on, is it a walking? Where? Oh, okay. And you'll notice that there's a figure in the road there. That is, that's me walking on the lot that we brought. 1969, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Could you speak a little closer to the mic? In the family room. Pardon? Okay. Okay. After that, two years later, we added the garage. I built it and we got all the proper permits at the time. Um, I'm good with my hands and like to construct things and repair things. And I'll turn the mic over to my daughter or my wife now. She has more to say. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Donna Lipnitz. And I'd like to share a few things with you here. Um, in 1970, I was a realtor in Sammamish for about eight years <laughs> before I had to get a job with benefits. <laughs> As houses were added on our street, we saw the need for a formal road maintenance agreement. So I used a standard form and typed it up, and all the neighbors signed as they moved in, and it was recorded. Here's the road in 1970. As you can see, it was really wasn't even gravel. It was just a cow trail. And, um, but we... Um, did maintain it with gravel, and in 2002, we paved it. We like where we live and socializing with our neighbors. Though we're retired now, my husband is very skilled with repairs and takes care of most things. I help too, like painting, and I even climb on the roof to deal with moss and debris. Don't tell my doctor that, though. <laughs> um, we maintain everything really well, and since there's just two of us, we only need to pump the septic every five years, which we do religiously on our property. Okay, as seniors, we also lived on a fixed income. It's also low enough that we qualify for reduced property taxes, which helps. We do not have any drainage problems, okay? and. Um, <coughs> and we never have had since day one. Still don't have. Um, however, we have watched many houses being built on the hill above, and we watched the water run down along Northeast 4th Street 
and 210th Avenue Northeast. We used to walk down that road, 210th, with our dog. And when they built two houses above us up there, we were walking along there one day and uh, we saw a lot of water coming down on the road. This was many years ago. And the only thing I could say was, oh my God, how did they ever get a building permit? That's how much water was going down that road. So uh, anyway, the city has permitted all these homes, which is causing flooding and issues for some of our neighbors. The city needs to deal with this stormwater, and I feel that they need to pay for it to fix it. It has come to my attention recently that the city council has the ideas for a local improvement district, but I don't think it'll pass. We should not be included since we've never had a water problem or a drainage problem. And at our age and level of income, we can't even think about any money for a lid. If forced upon us by the city, it would be a true hardship we would likely end up losing our home, and there's been talk about eminent domain. We can't pay for a lot of water problems that we don't have. We would likely, oh, excuse me, this is our first home and our only home, and it's the only place we really want to live. The city is in charge of stormwater, controlling runoff, and building permits. This infill growth has caused bad problems, especially for downhill folks. Tamarack owners have already paid enough in taxes and many fees. The city needs to step up and deal with this drainage issue and fully pay for it, in my opinion. Asking us to pay is just unfair, <laughs> and it's simply the craziest thing I've ever heard of. A couple of final notes, Council. I was here during the Ace Hardware deal, uh -oh. which as you know, we lost our hardware <laughs> store. Okay, we still miss it, trust me. And I'd like to know when we're gonna get a Dairy Queen and some Amish, <laughs> okay? And that's all I have to say on that right now, mm. for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Uh, the okay. only question I have is, uh, I have a septic tank too, and I don't consider it a religious experience. <laughs> you don't consider it what? I'm sorry. A religious experience. I mean, it, it isn't, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Todd Southwick, followed by Tyler Zagaglia. Good evening. Are you getting tired of seeing me up here? I have some things. That was a rhetorical question, right? My name is Todd Southwick, and the volume on the audio today is quite nice. Uh, my address is 413 209th Avenue Northeast, City of Sammamish. And I've spoken to you before, Honorable City Council and staff. Neighborhood drainage assistance from King County has been offered since 1992, NDA that is. Presently, the county offers and funds this uh, program for smaller projects and private use for up to 60,000 per year. More specifically, it is for private owners to address and solve problems they experienced but did not cause. Emphasis there, strong emphasis there, bunch of stars around that. We've watched all of this happen over a period of about 10 years and uh, it's amazing to duplicate some wording a few moments ago. Since the incorporation of 1999, the NDA program is not available to uh, Sammamish City residents, which is, that's very interesting in itself. 
the city is responsible for comprehensive stormwater management. Now, what is the meaning of comprehensive? I'll leave that to you to decide. Uh, it means everything, all. Um, the problems are allowed uh, to pass downhill, protecting, excuse me, uh, well, the NDA program protects public and private property both. The city of Sammamish just raised surface water fees by 5%, which everyone must pay. New policy and updated code are being added to Sammamish regulations, but means to address problems before they become bigger is missing. When problems are not addressed, they grow bigger and negatively impact more people, property, and hurt resources, including the environment. The first analogy, uh, imagine an oil spill. It must be cleaned up and contained before it spreads. This is what we're having uh, above us on the hillside. The note to the stormwater CIP, Southwest D Neighborhood Drainage Capital Resolutions is allocated 200,000 each year from 2017 through 2022 inclusively as an ongoing program to address minor flooding or drainage issues in a variety of Sammamish neighborhoods. Some or all of the funding and or new separate line items should be available to help private residents who are adversely impacted by drainage issues. Once again, it says they did not cause. So the city has allowed the building up 4th Street all the way up the hill and uh, as Mark Cross pointed out recently when he spoke, there are lots of new homes with big, big driveways, no septic tanks needed, and uh, there has been no infrastructure put along 4th Avenue coming downhill except for the rockeries on both sides of the street, and once they turn into 210, they disappear. So there's nothing there to take care of the water. This would provide a service for those who need it most and address problems using funding from surface water fees or other taxes we must pay. Each year, my medical health provider recommends me to, uh, that I get a flu shot, plus the shot is completely covered by my insurance. This intelligence, science-driven approach does have a cost, but it can really stop or reduce the problem from getting bigger. It lets us all and the medical community get ahead of this seasonal problem Viruses react to more severe issues or epidemics. Personally, it helps me stay healthy and avoid medical costs, but it provides protection to others too, reducing the chance that the flu will be passed on. Surface and stormwater problems are like a flu virus, uncontrolled, unmanaged. They hurt downhill people and property. But a program to respond to drainage issues provides help and timely resolution, benefits everyone, including our streams and lakes. Please fund in our city a neighborhood drainage assistance program that everyone, private or public owners, may use for problems beyond their control that require help. King County has set a precedent. It is something Sammamish must do that is missing. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Uh, Tyler is in Glaglia, followed by Michael Schneider. Right. Hello again. Is um, this homecoming pictures? <laughs> <laughs> a little different. Uh, my address is 25413 Northeast Third Place, Sammamish. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today uh, about uh, sort of a community event that we are putting on um, as an organization. Um, as you know, I work with a nonprofit called um, the Hope Festival. Um, and what we do is we aim to serve around 1,500 low income um, and homeless individuals across Sammamish, Redmond, Issaquah, uh, and Bellevue. Um, and so we've done this event for the past two years now, uh, and we'll be doing it again in February 2017. So as we started brainstorming for this event uh, a couple months ago, um, we wanted to create sort of a new way to fundraise, a new way that we can um, bring in a little bit of money for those, for those fees that we need to, to put on our event. Um, and so we sort of decided on why don't we make something that will not only raise those funds, but benefit the community at the same time. Um, so this is what we've come up with. Um, we're calling it, um, together we can create a happier Sammamish. Um, and how we're gonna do this is on December 3rd. Um, it's a Saturday next month. Um, we are going to have the teen center open to the entire community to come out um, and watch Happy, which is 
a movie that goes around the world um, to share the stories of different individuals, different communities um, on how to find happiness um, in everyday lives. And it's really powerful. Um, and then at the end, we'll have um, a great panel of people um, come together and speak on how they see that, um, how they see happiness in our everyday lives and how we can work it into our, uh, our community. So I wanted to let the council know about this, uh, this event and ask for your support um, in making this, um, we wanna make it awesome. We wanna get a lot of people there and I think that this panel of people is, is a great group. So we'll, um, we're excited to make it happen to get um, the viewpoints of different people on, on how we can make our community a better place. Tyler, what grade? It's a six to nine. Thank you. Seven to ten, yes. This is great, Tyler. Thank you Thank for you. spearheading this. Thank you. Looking That's forward to it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Michael Schneider, followed by Deb Sogi. Hi. I'm Michael Schneider. I'm at, living at uh, 22130 Northeast 13th Place here in Sammamish. And I'm also on the board of directors for Imagine Housing. We're a low-income housing group that provides housing for 465 families in 10 communities all on the east side, both low-income housing and supportive services. And tonight I'd like to talk with you a bit and encourage Sammamish in their support, their continuing support for ARCH the East Side uh, Housing Trust Fund. Uh, as you may know, in 1998, when the ARCH Parity Goals were created, the goal of the East Side Housing Trust Fund was to produce one to two million dollars each year for affordable housing. At that time, the average rent in King County was $849. Today, that average is $1,804 for the East Side as a whole and the median rent for a two-bedroom apartment in Sammamish is now $2,520. As rents and home prices rise, more and more people are being priced out of their east side communities, including teachers, administrative workers, and young people starting their careers. Over 30,000 East King County residents pay more than 50% of their income on housing, putting them just one crisis away from losing their homes. With the increase in the cost of housing, we have seen increases in homelessness in our communities. The five school districts that serve Arch member cities reported a collective total of 828 homeless students during the 2014-2015 school year. 296 were identified in the Lake Washington School District. And as our region takes on rapid growth, the cost of developing new homes is increasing rapidly as well. The cost of developing a new unit is now approximately double what it was when the East Side Housing Trust Fund was created in 1998. It is imperative that we keep up with the increasing costs of and need for housing. So the solution is that in light of the enormous level of need in our community and the dramatically changed economic context of our region, we had requested that the ARCH Executive Committee triple parity goals for the East Side as a whole. And I'm very pleased to note that in the last biennium, Sammamish allocated $20,000 initially and then added another $90,000 from a supplemental budget. And that we are proposing evidently $200,000 for this biennium. That's a, that's a sea change in our commitment to this issue. This is tremendous news and reflects our commitment to the parity goals. So we know that many cities are pursuing legislative strategies that would give them additional local funding authority and we applaud this work and hope to see a range of solutions like these but the need is immense and the homeless and unstably housed members of our community can't wait. Please, please let us continue to support ARCH to demonstrate our commitment to addressing our region's housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think it's important to note that on top of the 100,000 that's in the budget, we're estimating that we're gonna have $83,000 of fee waivers in connection with Dell Wonderful. development. So it's closer to 200 in the total and plus a 20,000 
So it's over 200 actually that we're contributing to the affordable housing. So it, it's a fair point and I think it's- It's, it's wonderful great. and if you have any spare property laying around, we're happy to develop it. <laughs> we still gotta build the houses down here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> have it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Deb Sogi. Deb Sogi, the Sammamis Chamber of Commerce at 704 228th Avenue Northeast Sammamish. And I too want to thank the council for your contributions to affordable housing. Uh, I'm a renter, so I understand what it's like. And the medium rental is for a two bedroom, 2000. So it's getting really difficult. <laughs> so thank you for your contributions. Um, also, I wanted to mention that Senator Andy Hill was a longtime supporter and member of the Sammamish Chamber and very big supporter of local business. So he will be missed. Um, also, I wanted to, on a lighter note, I wanted to thank the council for, and the mayor for considering the proclamation to support Small Business Saturday, November 26th. You joined the Sammamish Chamber of Commerce. We've been supporting it for years, and we believe it's very important to our small business community. Uh, our small businesses uh, make up about three quarters of the business in the U.S small businesses are big business. And uh, they represent restaurants that we have, boutiques, chiropractors, pet stores, and many more. They also represent the land of home-based business, which is Sammamish, that's what we're known for, as we have an estimated number of over 3,500 small businesses in, in the home, and that's estimated, I'm sure there's more. So I wanted to thank the council and the mayor for uh, recognizing small business and, to con and all the public to, I urge the public to support small business when they're shopping and especially the day after Thanksgiving and think about what they do. They're around us all the time in our daily lives and they work hard. Most of them are self-employed and they work very hard to make sure that the products and services are what Sammamish wants and what citizens are needing. So it's really a personalized service you get more from the small business than you do from big business, the chain stores. Um, <clears throat> the other things they do is they create jobs for our families. Uh, all my kids had jobs in Sammamish thanks to the small business and I'm sure several of yours did and will. So um, that's a big support for us. The other thing they do is they support all the nonprofits locally, especially the schools. And they do in-kind as well as cash uh, funding for these different projects and nonprofits. So small business is the one you'll get uh, more from than you will from the, the big chain stores because you're able to talk to the owner personally. Also, um, they, they contribute greatly to community by being volunteers and contributing to the welfare of the committees that are all over Sammamish. They have great insight because they meet with our families and our citizens every day. So please, when you think about shopping or going out to eat, think of Sammamish first. We are getting more restaurants, so it will get even easier. So um, all in all, I just want to thank you and urge the public and all of you here to support small business. They are the backbone of our city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deb. Deb, how small is a small business? Or how big is a small? <laughs> small business is considered 50 employees or less. Ah, okay. Yeah, and it's usually more like 10. <laughs> yeah, so Ace Hardware was perhaps a small Ace business. Hardware was a small business, and we would love to see them back. Yes, and we yes. do hear from them all the time asking <laughs> where they can be put. But we don't have much space, do we? No. Nope. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? We got a couple coming. Good evening, I'm Suzanne Scholl. I live at 416 208th Avenue Northeast in the Tamarack neighborhood. And I'm here to speak about the stormwater runoff onto Lewis Thompson Road at 210th Avenue Northeast. 
Uh, Lewis Thompson is marked by an 8% grade and has multiple curves uh, between East Lake Sammamish and 212th Avenue Southeast. And for a while now, drivers um, have been encountering stormwater runoff going across Lewis Thompson. And uh, this has become a public safety hazard, uh, which we hope the city uh, of Sammamish will address. Recent public records for the uh, Sammamish Police Department obtained via the King County Sheriff's Department show 102 dispatched calls for this section of roadway since 2007, which totals to about one per month. Um, the reports include accidents, including injury accidents, hit, hit and runs, trees down, and hazardous conditions. Um, I'm just citing three of these accidents uh, for your review. Um, one was uh, about 8 p.m. in the month of March where a white Honda Accord was traveling downhill on Lewis Thompson, struck a tree on the south side of the roadway. He went down the embankment and collided head on with a large cedar tree and the force of the collision spun the car around in the air with the rear bumper hitting another large cedar and the vehicle became lodged in between the two trees about 15 to 20 feet up in the air. The passenger was okay, but the driver was transported to the hospital with a broken ankle. Um, then in uh, April, about 8.30 a.m., a Volkswagen Beetle was traveling down Lewis Thompson um, in the 100 block, and the road was wet and slippery and when the vehicle went into the curve. Uh, the rear wheels lost traction and the car continued to um, accelerate and the driver lost control and slid off the roadway about 200 feet down the embankment and rolled over two times. The driver sustained minor injuries. Lastly, in late December around 10 a.m., a street sweeper was found on its side about uh, 20 feet east of 208th Avenue Northeast. The driver had been traveling downhill when it, um, a heavy snow shower was passing over and the road became covered and the driver lost traction and slid into the ditch, flipping over on the passenger side. The evidence showed that the roadway conditions and the steep downhill grade and tight curve contributed to the accident. There was no excessive speed or reckless driving. Um, there was no injuries or property damage other than the street sweeper. But these um, accidents show that the, the drivers who um, come in all types of vehicles up and down Lewis Thompson um, are encountering, have the potential to encounter the stormwater runoff, which will increase most likely the frequency and the severity of the accidents there on those curves. And um, this is creating a public safety hazard, again, which we hope that you'll address. Uh, the best way to fix the problem is to do the Tamarack drainage project. And uh, so the excessive development runoff will be um, managed and controlled and, and reduce the risk of accidents on Lewis Thompson. You can't put a monetary value on health um, or the life of individuals, and we feel that uh, the, the public safety is a concern here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Next, please. Good evening, council members. My name is Thomas Stagg. I live at 23226 Southeast 47th Way. I work at Novograd and Company, where I CPA firm that specializes in affordable housing, helping people structure deals with tax credits and other vehicles to provide affordable housing. Um, I just wanted to echo the comments of Mike that Michael made earlier and encourage you to take the pledge to increase the funding of ARCH. Um, Michael summed up the need in relationship to rent greatly, but there's one fact I want to point out. The, I have a daughter who goes to Sunny Hills High School, or not high school, <laughs> Sunny Hills <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> Thankfully, I have many years, so she's in high school. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We've been building, you know, yeah, probably, who knows what high school she'll go to about that point. Um, but the count said there's 109 homeless children that attend Issaquah, high school, Issaquah School District, and that's almost 10 students per grade. And the fact that we have homeless students attending schools in our area that has so much wealth really kind of points to me the need that we have for affordable housing. And as somebody who works a lot with structuring these deals, I can tell you that 
a little bit of soft funds, whether it's fee waivers, which I think is great and I encourage you to continue to do that, or monetary contributions goes a long ways to bridging that gap that we can't get all the way there with the federal subsidies. So I encourage you to continue to do that. And I noticed in last month's agenda, somebody mentioned they'd like more information on low income housing tax credits. I'm happy to talk to the council. I've been doing this for 15 years, have lots of experience, but I know I look like I've been, like I'm in high school with that gentleman back there, <laughs> but not quite. But I did bring this, a low income housing tax credit showcase. There's two properties in Washington State showcased in here, as well as properties from all across the country to show you what the tax credits do with the support of local money. If it's appropriate, I'd like to present it to the board if you'd like a copy of it. If not, I'll just take it back, but. Yes, if you could give it to our clerk. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for thank your time. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? Mary. Hi, my name's Mary Wichter. I live at 408 208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. And um, tonight I wanted to talk about silt and sediment that comes um, from the excessive development related runoff, which transports downstream into Zacoose Creek and the erosion shown in these pictures I pretty much took in the last week and a half. Um, this is Northeast 4th Street. You can see the development runoff. It's a 22% slope. The water's flowing pretty fast. And where kind of the little S-turves are, you can kind of see the lighter dirt there because that's where the erosion is happening. So sediment is continually peeled off the hill there. And then it goes down Northeast 4th Street. It, the, the ditch actually bends 90 degrees to head south toward Lewis Thompson. And because there's excessive runoff, it overflows everything because there's no place for it to go at that point. And it will head down to 10th Avenue to Lewis Thompson into Zacoose Creek. And at the top of the picture there where the arrow is pointing, that's actually a cross subbasin diversion that happens because there is no conveyance and nowhere for the water to go. So looking on 1022, this house, uh, the ditch in front of it is about two houses up from Lewis Thompson Road. And you can see the amount of silt and fine materials and sediment that's accumulated there. Those rocks and um, pieces of wood are actually placed there to be check dams to prevent the sediment from going and clogging the culvert below it. Four days later, with the amount of rain that we've had, you can see the runoff and you can see that it's pretty silt and sediment laden. <clears throat> and um, it's quite turbid and cloudy. So that's what it looks like. And then two days later, if I can get this clicker to work. Uh, because of the flashy, gushy flows that happen from all the development-related runoff, it transports the silt and sediment downstream. You can see no longer there, it's actually moved down to somewhere below it. So going to Lewis Thompson Road, going back to the 22nd, you can also see here in the roadside ditch on that same day, there was a lot of silt and sediment which was already accumulated. And you can see six days later that a lot of it had washed away. It goes downhill, it goes downstream. And to just kind of orient you, uh, this is Lewis Thompson Road where that sediment is, where it's circled in yellow. And that ditch continues down and goes right where 116 Lewis Thompson Road Northeast is. That culvert seen there, I think it's about an 18 inch, it runs under the road there and it will go to the south side. Um, so the culvert exit is under Lewis Thompson Road, so it's on the other side. It crosses underneath, and you can see where the arrow's pointing there. There's quite a bit of erosion that's happened, and that water also flows to, Z flat flows to Zacoose Creek. So this last week, I was able to go to the Kokanee Work Group meeting and listen as a public person, and I wanted to quote something from an email from David St. John from King County regarding longer-term sediment mobilization. So after the mudslide had happened last year, there were some emails traded and he said, sediment can mobilize for a long time after an actual event. Material progresses downslope over time and or as future high flow events occur and rising water interacts with slide material. Every single rainstorm in Tamarack, that water goes together and it floods the road and it brings sediment downhill and downstream. And I know that the city is interested in doing the culvert replacement and the stream rechannelization project. And it just seems really reckless to do those without also doing a project that will look at the inflow and manage the surface water there, uh, addressing these problems and improving water quality as much as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to address the council? No? Then public comment is closed. Next on the agenda, we have a, a executive session for potential property acquisition pursuant to RCW 4230110 1B. And this is estimated to be about 
Uh, we were estimating earlier about 15 to 20, but it's probably gonna be 20 to 30. What? So why don't we say 20 minutes, and then if we need okay. to extend, we can. So we're going to have a 20 minute executive session right now. Okay, back in session. See. Yeah. Good. Okay, next on the calendar is the consent calendar. And this is for payroll ending October 15th, approval of claims ending November 1st, the proclamation for Small Business Saturday on November 26th, and resolution 2016-702 adopting the City of Sammamish employee salary schedule for fiscal year 217 and resolution 2016-703, amending resolution 2015-655, which is the city's master fee schedule, and then resolution 2016-704, establishing medical insurance premium contribution rates for the fiscal, fiscal year 2017, and resolution 2016-705, accepting the Sammamish Landing parking and pedestrian access improvements as complete. And item seven is the contract for elevator maintenance with LTEC. And item eight is the approval of the minutes for the October 11th special joint meeting. And next on the agenda are public hearings. And item nine is the ordinance, second reading, amending Title 14 public works standards of the Sammamish Municipal Code by amending Chapter 1401 public works standards adopted. This is a second reading, we'll have a continuation of the public hearing, Mr. City Manager. Mr. Mayor, did, did you actually uh, ask council if you, to, to approve, approve the, consent? the consent account? I think so. A motion to approve the consent so moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. With me, with a technical, I will abstain from eight since I wasn't at the meeting. Oh. Very good. Okay. By your vote of basically 7 0. <laughs> it's approved. <laughs> Okay, item nine, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, tonight we have uh, a second reading and we would ask that this be a public hearing uh, without adoption. Uh, this will, is scheduled to come back to you uh, for adoption after the public hearing uh, of tonight continuing. Uh, so it will be coming back on the 15th, November 15th. And so a discussion on the public work standards of Sammamish Municipal Code. And Mr. Uh, Lindershevsky, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council and citizens. So just to provide an update, some of the questions that were going around of the document that is posted online is from the last meeting, which was a Tuesday night, it was handed off to a document editor to make it a format repair so not necessarily any substantive changes to the document that you have posted online and has been printed for you to have as a physical document. So the reason we were not entertaining necessarily any other discussion on it is we have your comments from the last meeting. We have met with master builders as to their comments. I do, the hearing will be open. Um, I do expect them to just make a continuation or ex extra comment. Um, we expect to be making these edits that will be brought forward in the next council packet. So all of the questions, comments, concerns that have been raised will be addressed or informed otherwise. There was even a couple questions from the mayor today. Um, so outside of that, if I understand patience is a virtue, but we are getting there, I promise. We are making progress. And the next update will have not only this remaining document there, but we'll provide a, a secondary one in the strike and delete format now that it is formatted. And it took, uh, thanks to the city manager's office, they lent us Mike Sugg, who spent the better part of a week just formatting and doing technical document editing and not content. So he did look at content too, made some grammatical uh, changes for us, but that's where the document is, which is why we had not necessarily entertained anything for this meeting and just wanted to provide continuation of the hearing till the next time. Any, any Good, any questions for staff? Seeing none, open the hearing. Thank you, we'll open the public hearing.
Thank you. Public hearing is now open on this uh, public works standards and I don't have a sign up sheet for that. Is there anybody that would like to address the council? I suspected that. Pictures, good. <laughs> we can pass one around. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, Council Members. My name is David Hoffman. I'm with the Master Builders Association, 335 116th Avenue Southeast in Bellevue. Um, just have a couple of comments, as Steve alluded to, um, and I just handed out a diagram uh, showing uh, current setbacks and um, one of our proposals that I just wanted to raise uh, for discussion tonight. It's my understanding that you and or the Planning Commission have already discussed this idea, and so just want to um, raise it again and um, uh, let you know that we are very interested in continuing that discussion. Uh, we did discuss this idea with staff. Um, in our meeting with them and really appreciate um, the work that they've put into this and that you and the Planning Commission have already put into this as well. Uh, the, the issue at hand really has to do with the 20 foot setback to the front of the garage that is required in city code and how the um, 60 foot right of way and the five and a half foot uh, planter strip on each side of the roadway affects um, the placement of the garages um, and the placement of homes on lots and really the effect of those placements and those setbacks on impervious surface um, and the impervious surface on every lot, um, every new lot that is um, designed and built in Sammamish. Um, essentially, the current requirements impose what would be effectively uh, 99 or 100 square feet of impervious surface on every new uh, every new lot in Sammamish, and we feel that's unnecessary. Uh, if the 20 foot setback to the face of the garage was counted from the back of the sidewalk as opposed to from the right of way, that would really provide a lot more flexibility for the placement of the home on the lot, provide for larger backyards, and would reduce the impervious surface at the front of the home um, next to, or, or in the driveway, excuse me. So. Those really um, are our concerns. That wraps up my comments and happy to answer any questions you may have. Mm -hmm. Questions for David? So what you're saying is the longer driveway is 16 feet wide? 18. Five, 18 feet wide. 18 feet, yeah. 99 square feet, yeah. Which is more impervious surface. Correct. So you're suggesting that the five and a half feet should count as part of the 20, is that what Correct. you're saying? Correct, exactly. Okay, I think we understand that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Is there anybody else that would like to address? Mary? Hi, my name is Mary Wichter, and I live at 408 200 8th Avenue, Northeast in Sammamish. Um, I spoke to this the last time that public work standards were in front of you, but since it's a public hearing, I think it's important to repeat it. Um, in looking at road standards, if everything has to be 20 feet wide with the sidewalk, um, you're making it that you will have stormwater problems and the city is also in charge of stormwater control management um, and water quality treatment will be added coming January 1st. So an example I'll give you for a road that I think is worth knowing about is if you're driving up Inglewood Hill and you get to the roundabout at 216th, if you take a right there, and then you take the next left, you'll be on Northeast 4th Street, and that's in Taburan neighborhood. It's a public neighborhood. <coughs> it was platted in 1977. It has drainage, so it has a really nice wide asphalt roadway. It's got gravel shoulders, and it's got nice little swales for ditches on both sides. You never see it have water problems because it's pretty flat in that area. And I just can't imagine that if you built that neighborhood or did something to it, that putting in a street with curb and sidewalks would make it nicer. Um, I can also tell you I was a trampolinist and I did a lot of running at junior Olympic <coughs> levels and when I sprained my ankle as an adult I went and had my leg x-rayed and the guy said hey you've broken your leg a bunch of times before and I said no <laughs> never broken my leg and he said well you have all these stress fractures running up your legs and it's from having run on paved roads and running on sidewalks and I believe I've also heard um, some young high school students talk about that we do need places and paths 
in the city where people can go and run or bike or walk their dogs, that it's not hard pavement. I also had a disc bulge in my neck and I was having a lot of pain and I could not even work. I actually had to go to the community uh, fields up by East Lake um, so I could be on field turf because just walking on asphalt and stuff hurt for a couple of years and I was able to get through that. So I think for looking at road standards, looking at surface water, looking at costs, looking at placement for developers, I think it's really important to do that. And um, just I'm gonna ask you again, if you're an older neighborhood that maybe has private roads or somewhere that is private roads, in order to get to the city standard, to get to the 20 feet wide with the sidewalks, you're gonna have to leapfrog past everybody to do something that's crazy and based on your topography, you might not be able to do it at all. So I would ask you to consider that again um, for streets because I think it's really important and it will get you with the stormwater if you force it through. Thanks. Good point, Mary, thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? No, then we'll continue the public hearing until which day? Uh, till the 15th. Until November 15th. Okay, now we'll go to the next order of business, which is item 10, ordinance first reading of the storm and surface water management comprehensive plan. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are very fortunate tonight to have uh, Cheryl Paston, our Deputy Public Works Director, and Tawny Dalzell, our Stormwater Program Manager, uh, here to uh, briefly uh, remind the Council on where we've been uh, with, with the uh, surface water, storm and surface water management comprehensive plan, uh, answer any questions, and uh, then uh, have take comment uh, as part of the public hearing. So without further ado, we'll turn things over to you too. So thank oh, you, uh, Mayor and Council. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I like standing tonight, it's a little bit better than sitting, it's crowded over there. Uh, so what you have in the packet for the community's uh, review is a new updated comprehensive surface water, oh geez, I already messed it up, surface, comprehensive storm and surface water management document. Um, I think the staff sitting and about to share with you have done a great job providing the comments in tabular format, where they are acknowledged, highlighting those and crossing those into the stormwater plan itself in yellow highlights so uh, everybody knows exactly where the comments are and how they were addressed. So. I don't have much to add. They're the technical experts and will be assisting you, but I think it's a, a great plan. They've done a great job um, providing that for the community. So I give you Connie and Cheryl. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, uh, City Council, Mayor, uh, City Manager. As Steve said, you'll, you do have quite a bit of paper in your, in your packet there. Hope you had a chance to review it. What I just wanted to add to, to what Steve said was that <clears throat> we did have four meetings with the Planning Commission starting in April. Uh, they did hold their public hearing on May 19th and closed it on June 2nd. We also had an open house on July 27th during one of the uh, farmer's market and had a really good attendance on, on it and, and so that was, that was great to see a lot of interest by, by our public. We, the Planning Commission then handed off the, uh, the document with a recommendation that it be adopted on September 6th. We then held a work session on September 13th and then returned on October 18th because there were s specific uh, questions about monitoring. So a couple of weeks, or maybe yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we came back and gave you a more in-depth presentation on the monitoring program that we currently do and then our plans for future monitoring. One of the outcomes of that was to add an additional action, which, we, which is to develop a, 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 a monitoring program that would look at our streams, our bogs, wetlands, uh, and our lakes. And then we will come back to you at, at some point in the next year or so with, with more detail about that and along with costs and level of effort. So that's, we, we don't have a PowerPoint finally this time. We just are here now to hopefully you'll open the uh, public hearing and, and answer any questions. Okay, any questions of staff at this point? <laughs> I'll have some later, Don. Okay. Well, then we'll open the public hearing. And uh, I have uh, Jan Bird, followed by Sharon Steinman. Uh, 
um, Jan Bird at 3310 221st Avenue Southeast. And uh, first I'd like to thank the city for their support of our stormwater stewards that I'm part of. This is part of our Sammamish Community Wildlife Habitat Group and uh, that we are able to collaborate with the city in restoration efforts uh, starting out with the Lancaster Stormwater Pond, hopefully more down the road. And we appreciate that this concept of restoration is being considered as part of the comprehensive plan. And just to put in a plug for uh, both L.B. Jones and the Parks Department and uh, Tawny Dalzell, they've been just really great to work with. We have both departments working together to help us with this project. So a big thank you to both of them. And I also ask that the council approve the enhanced level of service that's in this budget, which will fund services beyond which what they're already providing. And this is gonna include spending time working with community groups such as ours, uh, LID educational materials for it looks like staff, developers, and the general public. Uh, that includes stormwater retrofit strategies and implementation. Uh, it's going to establish criteria for land acquisition and create a property acquisition fund. It'll help us map and prioritize fish, fish passage culverts and implementing that and also update the web page among many other very good things. Uh, we've lost so much wildlife habitat to development that we need to make the best use of public land we have. And this also includes stormwater facilities and can help rebuild our habitat, increase canopy cover. So I'd like to see the city be a leader in innovative ways to handle stormwater. If we stick to just the bare bones, we won't have the resources to do better than just the status quo. So uh, I, I hope that you'll um, approve the budget as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Sherry? Sharon Steinbiss, I reside at 24933 Southeast 14th Street. I'm with the Sammamish Community Wildlife Habitat Group and the Sammamish Stormwater Stewards. I'd like to support the 2016 stormwater plan presented to you by staff. I'd also like to support the proposed budget to implement the plan. Stormwater is rainwater, and this past month we saw record rainfall. The stormwater plan seeks to manage this rainfall in a way that is efficient and aesthetically pleasing, as well as a benefit to the environment and, well, and wildlife. We don't want this stormwater containing sediment and toxic chemicals to run into Lake Sammamish and pollute the lake and damage or kill the kokanee salmon. Nor do we want to see stormwater prisons consisting of concrete blocks and chain leak fences. We hope to see green stormwater infrastructure that uses the natural filtering capabilities of native plants and soil to purify rainfall and put it back into the aquifer. The Sammamish Stormwater Stewards would like to thank the city staff, the city stormwater staff for their support of our effort to retrofit, retrofit stormwater ponds in Sammamish. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? feel famous here. <laughs> I'm Mary Wichter. I live at 408 208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. So in addition to city council meetings, I've also been attending planning commission and other meetings. So I've seen the stormwater comp plan several times before and given input. I didn't have time to read all the updates in the new revision today, but there's a few things I would like to comment on. First, for stormwater, precipitation is ultimately important. How much comes from the sky is related to rainfall to runoff ratios. And if you're gonna do any monitoring, you have to have records, you have to know when it's happening. And if you take things to test, you have to know how much water you got in the last couple days. So I would like to see that rain gauges, automatic ones with telemetry are implemented in several places that make sense in Sammamish. I would also encourage the city to work with share data and partner with King County Hydrology, Sammamish Plateau Water, and probably Issaquah and Redmond for numbers. There's a lot of monitoring that's going on on the King County website. You can see Allen Lake, other streams. Um, King County will support other cities. They will actually host your data for free. They have the backing of uh, the King, King County Council to do that. They also have funding from multiple resources. So if you are able to get data and you put it up there, then it's things that everybody can use. I have done that with the water district. They're putting it up. They just have to send it once a month. And I would just like to see you use that as a resource and also talk to those people. They have quite a few um, people. Um, back in 1998 and 1990, King County, I'd identified a lot of uh, 
sensitive areas. I want to make sure none of those are left out. I'm a little bit concerned because I see new words called slide hazard areas. There is a landslide hazard area. Mm -hmm. There is a landslide hazard drainage area, which were well defined in city as maps since 1998. And then there's also steep slope areas, which is in the code, but I don't see it get implemented. I know it's been overlooked places. I know Bellevue, for example, actually combined their steep slopes and landslide hazard areas together to handle it. And I just don't want any of those important pieces that were identified so long ago to get dropped off in this comp plan. Um, a couple just small technical things on page 161 of the packet for uh, figure 3.8. There's a diagram showing surface water facilities, which is great. However, it does have things on there that are they're there, but they're not actually there. They're on the map. So if you look uh, between Inglewood and Tamarack uh, by Northeast 6, there's a great big red area for a surface water facility, which is not there. Maybe it will be one day, but I don't think we should put them in the plan until they're actually there. What um, page was that, Mary? Uh, page 161 out of the whole packet. It's figure 3.8. Oh. It's a map for the oh. surface water the facilities. Old old. I'm glad they have it. I just don't think we should put yeah. stuff on there that's not there yet, might not be there for a while. I don't know. I also noted, and I think some of the council comments, or some of the conveyance systems have not been mapped yet, like the area I live has no conveyance system mapped in it. Um, I definitely, I, I love the staff that I work with at the city. I think the city has lost a lot of good people. I think they've gained a lot, and I think they've moved people around, but I just honestly think there isn't enough staff, so I'd like to see more funding for that. And just a final quick note on A26 is one of the appendix. You're talking about when uh, working with the water district, if there's a water problem that you'd update a water pipe, well, they also do sewer, so you should put sewer as part of that. And I will read in detail and provide more um, information the next time I get public comment for public hearing. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would address the council? <coughs> well, then we will continue this public hearing until the 15th. I have some questions. Out we go. Okay. Um, you can use the button, too. Councilmember Odell. Thank you. <coughs> Questions for staff. Um, if you bear with me, I'm going to just plow through the book because I've got them highlighted in here. I'm on uh, Exhibit 3, page 59 in the current book. This is where you're talking about the uh, uh, types of water quality monitoring that's currently being done. Um, I don't recall ever seeing any results from this. Uh, are these generally available for council? The, the 2015 Ebright Creek monitoring report is online, uh, and last two weeks ago, um, the update that we provided on monitoring had a link to that report for the, the first year of monitoring that we had completed for Ebright Creek. Uh, it may not be the updated link because we've had a uh, web um, an update to our website. So I can provide that to you. Okay. I'd appreciate getting a copy of that. Yeah. And then on the next page, page 60 in the middle, it says the city does not have any streams or storm water, storm water facilities included in the regional water quality and monitoring program. Uh, so we're uh, basically looking at Pine Lake and Beaver Lake, as I understand it, but streams are not included and if we are going through the process of trying to improve the uh, uh, spawning capability of the streams for the kokanee uh, I personally think we should be monitoring those even at the expense of dropping under the regional program because uh, I'm not seeing that we're getting much under the regional program that directly affects the manage unless I'm badly mistaken 
the, the effects are the results of the regional program or regional. Uh, they, they randomly selected a number of streams within the Puget Sound area based on a statistical process of random selection. Unfortunately, uh, our streams were not included in that selection process by the Department of Ecology. However, the information that they obtain from the monitoring of those streams uh, will help the region develop standards for future implementation of water quality and flow uh, as development uh, continues to happen in the region. So th those results will help to inform the Department of Ecology in setting likely new NPDES permit requirements in the future. I absolutely agree that our streams in, in Sammamish uh, have lacked monitoring that we, we should likely be doing if we want to improve the conditions of kokanee habitat. Uh, so there are opportunities for us to do this and uh, through our action plan for the comprehensive plan, we intend to come back to the city council on a water quality monitoring program where we will develop different monitoring um, programs throughout the, throughout the city, not, not just including streams, but wetlands um, and uh, lakes that are not Pine or Beaver Lake, and come back to you guys to develop what you guys want to see. Okay, uh, just, just as a follow-up on that issue, Tony, while we're contributing financially to monitoring elsewhere, and this all feeds into the overall Puget Sound Raya 8 effort, is the reason where you're going, I think, uh, would not switching the focus for us to our local area also contribute to that same regional effort? I believe it would, but I do not believe that the Department of Ecology would agree that we could substitute monitoring of our streams with a um, with either one contributing to their program or two uh, providing a program within the city that they approve and so they're going to have a lot of input and fingers in the development of our system um, so th those are two options. The city of Redmond has taken on that, that option too, where they have developed mm -hmm. a program within their city to opt out of payment uh, to the regional storm um, stream monitoring program. They have uh, indicated to other jurisdictions that it's, it's an extremely difficult way to meet the ecology permit requirements. And ecology is actually making them, as I shared with you last time, making them monitor locations that don't even have water flow because of the randomization that ecology requires on this. So it's extremely difficult to meet the requirements and costly, four times as costly is what we're hearing from, from Redmond. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, number one, maybe we should ask if they would play ball with us in this respect and what the conditions might be so we do know. Number two, uh, we're looking at replacing three culverts down on the parkway at roughly a million dollars a piece. It'd be nice to know that we're doing the right thing and uh, <clears throat> the cost of the monitoring is uh, relatively minor part of this whole thing and I think it's an essential part uh, because I like to know that the streams can in fact support uh, the fish population. Uh, Tom, yeah. Tom, could I answer, answer that? I think yeah. staff has looked at that and has determined that uh, we would be better off continuing to work with the Department of Ecology and then going over and above and supplement uh, the monitoring uh, over and above that <coughs> And we could, in fact, uh, be more efficient in the in the resources uh, that we have. Uh, so we continue with the ecology program and then add monitoring uh, throughout the city in areas that we want to monitor, mm -hmm. as opposed to what mm -hmm. we're being told we must monitor. I'd go for that. 
<coughs> that that is the plan uh, that we'll come back to council with a, a full monitoring uh, uh, regime, basically uh, coming next year to Good. you. Okay, Tom. Other comments? Uh, yeah, I'm still. Or should we go around the horn and then okay. get back to you? The hornish. <laughs> um, okay, Councilmember Altel. That was great. <laughs> Mic on. <laughs> <laughs> you guys heard me on that comment. Okay. Okay. So it was just to clarify the date. Um, page 63, uh, third paragraph. There was um, a clarifying statement added in where we, where we say within these positions, only three full time non maintenance positions provide 100% services. I think that was in response to Councilmember Hornish's request for clarification. I'm just not sure I love the word only being in there. Um, I know where we were going with this, but, um, and then there's an extra space. It appears there's an extra space for, between the word 100, or one and 100. Page 79, we talk about two private golf courses. However, I think it is worth clarifying the fact that most of the Plateau Club is actually not in Sammamish, only part of it is. So I would suggest using the term private golf courses rather than the two private golf courses in Sammamish. That was Thank all you. We will make those changes. Isn't the clubhouse in Sammamish? The clubhouse is and part of the golf courses, but only a few of the holes. Most of it is we'll actually. We'll call it a par three or something. <laughs> something like that. Most of it's in unincorporated yeah. King County. <coughs> okay. Uh, Council Member Keller. Thank you. Just a quick comment. Uh, it's really a follow up to uh, my comment last week, which really tails in, uh, not last week, but our last session with what Council Member Odell was talking about in terms of monitoring. I had brought up the idea of monitoring our wetlands. You know, there's, I think mm -hmm. I said, as I recall, it's 864 acres of. Mm -hmm of uh, wetlands in the city, uh, much bigger than the lake surface water we have on the lakes. So I wanted to emphasize that importance. And I think I had heard earlier that you said that would be part of the work plan eventually when you get to monitoring, you will include wetlands, mm -hmm. which I think that's really good. But I, I wanted to make a comment about even if it is testing to start with, because I think w I read in here that um, even where the health department should be doing some testing uh, in the city, they're not doing it. To our knowledge, they haven't done any of it. So I'm almost wondering is, in addition to monitoring, rather than ongoing, that we actually try to go through the city and actually see if we have any problems in the city, if we've never done any testing mm -hmm. in the past. So something we might want to add on to that, to the monitoring plan. And, and just to clarify, you're speaking specifically on wetlands, not our swimming beaches, no. for example. Okay. No, no, I'm not talking okay. about that type. I'm talking about the wetlands. I mean, okay. we have so many large wetlands in the, in the city that have not been tested and look at the development that has occurred around them and we have no idea really with the status of them. We'll, we'll make sure to address that in the monitoring plan that we'll come back to you. Councilmember Huckabee. Uh, yes, I just had a quick question. In terms of, and I like that idea of monitoring on the regional level and then supplementing our own, are we able then to design our own monitoring system or does that also have to be blessed by or approved by or designed by Department of Ecology? As long as we make our contribution, we meet our permit requirements, and then we can decide as a city without judgment or um, criteria from Department of Ecology on what we monitor. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Mayor Valderrama. 
Yes, for staff, um, during the capital improvement projects uh, analysis of the budget, we were not able to come up with a prioritized list at that time. Now that we're doing the comprehensive stormwater list, what's the path so that we can come up with a prioritized list? Of how many more boxes do we have to check to get that together? One of the tools that we will be able to to give to the council is through our basin planning. Part of the basin planning will identify where the deficiencies in are in our in our uh, drainage service area. So we'll be able to give you a list of projects, uh, future projects, and then along with a, a set of criteria that you could use to prioritize. Right now, so so the current six-year CIP does have <coughs> projects that are prioritized in them. Uh, a, a f I, I don't remember off the top of my head now, but there is a good portion of the stormwater fund that is paying for the stormwater components of the transportation projects. So those are clearly a priority because you know, you know we, you've prioritized the uh, TIP. So so there is a fair amount of the the stormwater CIP that that is prioritized simply because the TIP is 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 prioritized. If that makes sense. Then the other projects, Inglewood, for example, <coughs> obviously we need to finish that one, so that one is a prioritized project. Yeah, that one's As underway already. It, it is underway, but it, but it will, the, we will still, I think, be making payment, our final payments in 2018, or 2017, sorry. And then you've prioritized the uh, Zekus Creek culvert project <coughs> that's underway right now. So partly by virtue of the fact that maybe they've been, uh, They've been needs over the over the last number of years that either this existing council or, or past councils have put it on public works uh, work plan to to complete. Now I understand, or it's my understanding that there's not been a a consolidated set of criteria that the council uses every time to. Uh, prioritize the projects, but that's certainly something we want to do in, in the future. No, that is, and because we've been taking projects piecemeal, like the Engel one, because of the emergencies that we've been overcome, and it's uh, important for all of us to sit down and have a holistic view of the city and how we're going to address it. A problem that's been woefully underfunded, and we're going to have to address it over decades to make up for it. And so I think the council would like to be able to sit down and be able to start holistically looking and saying, how are we going to address these problems? We've been waiting, as you had mentioned, the basin plans, we're waiting for this plan. Do you see anything else that we would preclude us from having that discussion and coming to that resolution next year? I guess I will defer to. Uh, I, I believe that. we will be well on our way next year uh, through some of the studies and, and planning that we are, will be doing. Uh, I won't say that it will be complete next year, but uh, we will be well on our way. Uh, the the comprehensive surface water plan will help us uh, with the criteria mm -hmm. and setting the priorities for that particular area. As you know, we're going to be looking at uh, some uh, transportation master plan. For exactly. Example. That will help us with prioritizing. Uh, that area as well. And then we're also going to be doing the uh, uh, the uh, parks uh, pro plan uh, that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit later this evening uh, as far as scoping that project. So all three of those uh, areas will assist council and, and staff uh, working together to set those criteria for the prioritization. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Hornish. Yeah, I like the plan. It looks good. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the two Thank questions you. I have are more finance uh, oriented because we you talked about you're going to come back to us for the monitoring plan that is or is not in the proposed budget. Is there any money allocated for a monitoring plan? I believe there is money for a monitoring plan that is required under the MPDES uh, requirements. But it but may not be as robust as what as we're going robust to be about, as yeah. what council has directed staff to do, and so we will be coming back to you with a more robust plan for your consideration next year. Should we consider raising the robust dollars uh, in the plan? I, I believe I believe where we are at this particular point enough. in time, I think there will be sufficient. We may need to come back to you for a budget amendment. Okay, uh, but we believe based on the five percent. 
uh, increase in surface water fees that there would be sufficient okay. uh, funding Fair there. Enough. Then along the same lines with the basin planning, if I recall, that wasn't in our six-year CIP. Or no, I'm sorry, it's not in the next two years biennium. So it's another budget consideration. It was, I just raise it. I don't know how you want to address that. Uh, if, if we're going to do the basin planning, but we don't have it budgeted, should we consider, since we haven't adopted the budget yet, of adding that in? Uh, I believe it's a matter of uh, resources, and I think we've got a lot on our plates the over the next year. two years. Okay. Uh, it is a priority for us, but it's one of those things. I think if we do too many things at once, uh, there, then we'll run into some issues. Fair enough. Okay. And back to you, Teal. <coughs> Thank you. Um, maybe I could help on the money issue. I'm looking at uh, page A20 of Exhibit 3. Page what? Alpha 20. Okay. And uh, the issue here is... Uh, two grant applications a year. I'm wondering if uh, we should turn up the gain and shoot for more than two. So you have a pretty good payback. We will go after as many grants as we can find. <sighs> that are Definitely. <laughs> but we didn't, We, you know, it's kind of a under promise over deliver on this one cause, because the grants are totally out of our control. We, we definitely keep our eyes out though for all grant applications. I know a lot of what we've been talking about, uh, both in terms of uh, monitoring the, the stream projects, the culverts, these are all grant, grant territory, so I, I hope we grab everything we can. Okay, uh, continuing on, I'm on uh, page 823, which is adopting surface wire design manual and revised city standards. There's $45,000 in there for that. Isn't that what we're talking about doing right now? Is it, or is there something else going on here? No, it's what we're currently doing. And we'll come back to you uh, next week with a uh, handoff from the Planning Commission. Uh, I don't believe that this dollar amount is in the 1718 budget. Okay, led me to believe that it was, but okay. Any more? Uh, just one. When do we think we'll have the results of the stormwater rate study? I, sorry, I'm just yes, hesitating. I think, I think actually Steve could probably best answer that <laughs> to the rescue. <laughs> So the goal is to have it before December 1 next year because if there is a rate adjustment needed, we have to provide it to the county to collect in 18 by that deadline in December, which is December, for, December 1st of 2017. I hope we'd have it in time for the mid-buy. Uh, I would not be able to promise that well, to you. Well, ac actually, actually, that will be for the mid-buy adjustments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be. Right. I think if you're talking for, for about 18. July yes. of 2017, because we have to have a conversation about what we want to go into that stormwater plan before they can come up with the rate yeah. approval, and that, that's the first step. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, thanks, Steve. So I hope to be done by third quarter of 17, so we can then move forward with adjustments if, right. if, right. if necessary. Yeah. Okay, any oh. further questions? No? Okay, so uh, um, this is only a first reading, and we have the second reading scheduled for, for the 15th also. For the 15th. Okay, good. Thank you. Now we're on to the... <coughs> Thank you, Steve. We are now on to Ordinance 11, 12, and 13, which is the... Um, Property tax levy, levy of regular property taxes, and first reading and adopting the biennial budget. Mr. City Manager. Mayor, uh, we have our uh, finance director, Aaron Anton, uh, coming up to the podium, along with our deputy city manager, Jesse Bond. Uh, this will be a tag team effort on the description. We are going to be essentially talking about items 11, 12, and 13 together 
Uh, and then uh, please feel free to uh, ask us questions as we go through the presentation. You don't want uh, us to hold for the questions? Yeah. That's dangerous, you know. I know. It's, <laughs> we're, li we're living on the edge tonight. Okay. Okay, so tonight, uh, essentially what we're going to be doing is having a discussion uh, with you tonight, uh, and the intent is to follow up on items from previous meetings that we've had uh, where, where staff has felt that uh, we did not quite uh, achieve uh, either consensus or direction uh, from council. So tonight we're gonna talk about ARCH funding and uh, try to clarify that. Uh, we were charged with coming back and talking about the major planning work over the, over the biennium for the next two years. And we've done a bit of rearrangement of that after conversations with the uh, Finance Committee as well as the Transportation Committee. Uh, we also have uh, some clarifications as related to the Heritage, Heritage Society. Uh, they asked for, uh, uh, essentially we are proposing uh, $5,000 a year uh, to them, which is our current level. Uh, there was a discussion uh, and presentation that they made asking for more money, uh, but we sent a uh, email to you uh, earlier this week, and we believe that the uh, two twenty thousand dollar grants uh, would, or one of the twenty thousand dollar grants that they have uh, in process, could be used for matching uh, for next year. So uh, we don't believe that that is necessary. Also, the question as to the Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park, uh, you recall that we proposed a budget of $10,000 per year uh, contribution to them, and they actually came back and uh, asked for 15000 a year. So currently in the uh, budget for the Heritage, Heritage Society and the Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park, uh, we proposed $5,000 for the Heritage Society and $10,000 uh, for the uh, Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park. However, uh, council uh, could in fact direct us uh, separately. Then also tonight we are doing the uh, first reading to the budget ordinance and then uh, property tax ordinance first reading as well. There's also item number 11, which is a declaration of substantial need uh, for setting uh, the property tax levy. This would be the bank capacity uh, related to that. And then again, we'll talk about next steps <coughs> going forward. Okay. Uh, so uh, getting into a couple of the items uh, under social and human services, uh, this is the ARCH discussion. And as was mentioned earlier this evening by Council Member Hornish, uh, what uh, we have determined uh, is that uh, we estimate over the next 10 years there will be fee waivers of approximately $80,000 per year. Uh, there will be annual contributions from the Community Development Block Grant Program of $20,000 per year. And as discussed with the uh, Human Service Committee, uh, we uh, are proposing a $100,000 annual con cash contribution uh, from the general fund uh, in the budget. but. Uh, that, that is what is included. Our parity goals as set by 1998, uh, as mentioned, is uh, somewhere between 25,000 and 196,000, which is essentially 200,000. So uh, our proposal is that we would meet uh, the upper end of that parity goal. Currently, uh, ARCH is under discussions and reviewing the parity goals going forward uh, for the future, and uh, we'll have a better discussion with council in, in next year. So, Mr. Hornish, I yeah, think you had a comment. I think that's the discussion that we, we need to have next year after ARCH comes out with their new parity goal to determine what the aggregate amount is that we want to contribute in all ways cash, fee waiver, uh, community development, uh, block grant. Um, so, that's a bigger discussion. But just to highlight, the 1998 parity goal. Top end of 200, 200,000, 196. Did not include Kahani, does not include the time value of money over the last 17 years, 18 years. Um, so the 200, I think, 
and, and roughly what we're doing with the budget proposal is 100 cash, 83 estimated waiver. We can adjust that up, that plus the 20 uh, from the community development grant. We can adjust it up and down in the mid five uh, as needed, subject to what the parity comes back to. So it's a, it's a longer discussion next year, but we don't have the definitive numbers right now. Uh, we thought the 100,000 cash was the best we could come up with right now. Question to, but when we talk about the parity next year, it again will be a range. Right now we're at the current parity higher level recommendation. Then we will see what the range they have and where we want to fall in that band. Correct. Okay. Remember, it doesn't include Spahani. Well, I understand. Yeah. Well, that didn't even include the city. We weren't around in 1998. I think the formula for the parity goals was discussed in 98 uh, and then applied to Sammamish in, in 99. Okay. Council Member Huckabee. Uh, yes, and I was just going to suggest that in terms of the uh, fee waiver and the total budget that we tend to look over a two-year period of time. So if we said 100000 a year, and just for, ex for example, we say 200000 per year, the fee waivers could be indeed 50000 in one year, and then the next year we could go up to as much as 150000 or rather 50, excuse me, so that the fee waivers over the two-year period would be 100000 So if they're lower or higher in the first year, we would adjust the second year by previous understanding that it wouldn't cap that hundred thousand dollars. Well, I think we, so would, we would we would want to come back to council to have a budget adjustment. Mm -hmm. We uh, would want to have yes. the budget adjustment. I agree, but I think As a I don't think we want to set a policy that we'll do. We'll look at the fee waivers year by year. We want to have some total that we're working out with cash in fee waivers. Correct. And because that fee waiver is so unpredictable, it could be much higher or lower, so. Okay. Good point. Okay. I was there with it. Mm -hmm. well, it's real money, so. I, I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. In general, okay. oh, I'm sorry. And generally, I, I kinda do, but the problem <laughs> is in the second year, you're not gonna know what the fee wa waivers were when you're trying to adjust it. Yeah, we're always going to be basically looking. Need to do it a rolling. We'll be, we'll be, looking, we'll be looking in the rearview mirror, I think, right. to make adjustments from the, the prior year prior. Year. That, that's Good what point. I would agree with. Uh, it's a rolling year, not right. a two year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Are we comfortable with that topic? Yep. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. One down. Okay. And now I'll turn things over to our deputy city manager, Jesse Bond. Um, thank you very much. When we were last here in October, we introduced the idea of um, <laughs> restructuring our major planning work such that the transportation master plan would start in 2017 instead of 2018 as uh, was reflected in your budget, preliminary budget draft. At that meeting, uh, we did get some head nods. Yes, go ahead and do that work. So. Between then and now, we have uh, both taken a look at the budget impact and the schedule impacts and made those adjustments. The non-motorized planning work uh, is now included as part of the transportation master plan and the parks, recreation, and open space plan. So essentially, for, for a number of years, we've been talking about doing a non-motorized plan update. Um, because of the order in which the plans are now going, we have said, let's, let's take a, a time out here and and do a little planning diet. So we've worked with the public works team and the parks uh, team and recognize that we can, we can take that work um, and include it in both of those other major plans. And I'll show you a graphic in just a minute. The urban forestry management plan, we've already talked about this, is a very high priority, but to allow us to manage this planning work, we will stagger the start. So it will start mid 2017. The ADA transition plan, an equally high priority, will also be a staggered start and will start at the end of 2017. So the impact of all of this is an additional $100,000 in street engineering budget, professional services. That's uh, partially due to the, the need to bring on a contracted staff person earlier than we had planned. Uh, that person I, I mentioned is uh, John Cunningham. He'll be coming back to help us um, support the transportation master planning work. We also realized savings by combining the non-motorized planning work with the other two plans. Uh, there were no other budget impacts, just changes in the, in the plan development timing. 
So here's what this looks like now, very similar to what you saw last time. The very top, the transportation master plan, which doesn't is essentially one and the same as the transportation comp plan update. And we'll also take a look at the transportation impact fees. Um, we'll be starting very quickly with consultant selection. I mentioned the ADA transition plan end of 2017. Uh, the pro plan update, which you're gonna hear a little bit about later tonight, is actually going out for consultant uh, for an RFP in the next couple of weeks. Land acquisition strategy has started. YMCA property study is nearly started. Uh, and and you, can, you can see the rest. I, will, I continue to observe and will point out that 2017 is a heavy, heavy planning year. And uh, we look forward to working with you on the <laughs> this scheduling strategies and, and how we will navigate uh, not only council meetings but also the public process. Any questions? Nope. Okay, so we're, next we're gonna go into the budget ordinance itself. Oh. So tonight just, we have- uh, Council Member Hornish. Can, can you go back to that slide? Just Because uh, I had talked about a second ago the basin plans. You've got on here on the, the planning calendar, the, the Zacoose Creek Basin Plan. And that is now budgeted. I just wanna clarify in my head. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Tonight we're at the uh, November 1st of our calendar there. We're moving along our, our process schedule for the budget. We have the first reading and the public hearing on the budget tonight. Uh, we already took uh, action a little earlier this evening on several of the resolutions showing there. Uh, we still have the uh, property tax coming up here and um, the budget ordinance itself. So then that's to be followed by the November 15th, second reading of those ordinances and potential adoption. As an overview, this is the attachment to the budget ordinance itself. So we're looking at a $216 million budget. This is the two year 2017, 2018 picture. And you'll notice here it, it is balanced, right? You know, revenues are equal, equaling expenditures. So we'll take a look kind of at a high level on both the revenues and the expenditure side. So first we'll take a look at the revenues that $154 million total, that doesn't include any new taxes, okay? So that's remained consistent from the preliminary budget until, until and through now. Uh, something to note here is just in the dollars breakdown, we're looking at 56 million coming from the property taxes as the primary source there. Uh, you can see the breakdown of the other types of taxes as well. This next slide shows it as a percentage basis. So you can see the majority coming from property taxes and sales taxes. For the capital funding, you're looking at REIT and impact fees, the real estate excise tax, REIT and uh, So Aaron, could fees. you go back to the previous one? Um, notice transfers uh, 23 million. So what you're saying then is 131 million for the biennium is actual revenues. Right, so yes, so transfers refers to the dollars between funds, right? right. Moving between general fund and the other funds the operating funds, the capital funds. So yeah, if you exclude transfers, that would be the, the lower total you mentioned. Erin, did you say whether the swim fee is, has been updated or not? Swim fee, the 5% is, in is included in this. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was the percentage base. So then uh, comparing that to the overall, this is a, a larger East Side Cities comparison. So taking a look at resources, uh, general fund revenue per capita on the east side, and you can see Sammamish in the middle there, $730, uh, a lot lower than any of the surrounding neighbors. So we, we track this slide, and historically that's been the case. It continues to be the case. Uh, the other thing to mention on this slide particularly is the utility and BNO tax, obviously not part of the Sammamish numbers there, and they are for the other cities and continue to be a source of resources for those on the east side. Moving over to the expenditure side and reviewing that 199 million, you'll recall the prior presentations, we walked through the org chart of the different funds on expenditures, both between the capital funds, the operating funds, and just as the mayor mentioned, the transfers between those. Uh, so from the expenditure total side, 199 million. Again, transfers are 23 million of that. Largest portion of that general fund, it's a two year total, 73 million capital funds amount to the 75 million, then you have the street fund, the other operating funds, which is where the stormwater 
fund would come into play as well. Then a percentage basis on that, you can see that, of course, the majority there is the, the general fund and the capital funds. So looking at expenditures per capita, so another of one of our financial health indicators, again, Sammamish, uh, lowest on the chart here, $622 uh, per capita expenditures on the east side, so uh, you know half of Pisiquah and less than half of Redmond there, uh, the nearest neighbors. Uh, and taking a look at ending fund balances, so we showed you a snapshot at the October 11th presentation breaking down by fund the 17.9 million total ending fund balances. And so we're gonna update you with the, the changes that happened since then. So recall that in the September 20th presentation, there was the new, new staffing that was added, the 8.75 plus the additional contract position with uh, police services, the traffic enforcement uh, police officer. Then at the October 11th, there was discussion of the three additional positions in public works, and so those three are included in that set of numbers, those handouts that you have. That makes the grand total adds their 11.75 FT8. So that was included also in the budget message that's part of the packet. So from a number standpoint, we're going from that earlier ending fund balance that we talked about on October 11th of 17.9 million. Then these changes that got rolled in, uh, are listed there, basically. You're, you're walking through the uh, change for the, the phasing of the tr master transportation plan and those other planning documents. That was a, a net additional expense of around 100,000. You had your three additional public works positions. There was an increase in funding for the communications, $15,000 as well at the October 11th meeting. And then that 5% swim fee actually increased revenue. So that's a, a positive to fund balance there. So the net of those changes, the new fund balance is 17.4 million, and that's reflected on the table A attachment to the budget ordinance. So here's that same snapshot that we showed you earlier on ending fund balances. I've just circled the different funds that were impacted by those changes, so you can see how that uh, uh, maps over to the changes that we talked about from the 10, 11 point to 11, one here tonight. So another note on the general fund, so we talked about the, the strategic reserve portion of the general fund dollars. So since the general fund, the ending fund balance has changed slightly, that 10% number changed. Uh, it's currently 10% of those funds is 4.5 million. Our, our budget includes 5.69 million in reserve. So that's now 12.7%. That percentage was higher before you may recall. So that's just tracking with what the strategic target is. And so the next step here really is the second reading if there's no further changes and uh, hear the public hearing tonight on the budget and the property tax. So from a budget standpoint, uh, that's, that's the next step for the budget. Okay, questions for staff. Council Member O'Dell. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Aaron, I'm looking at uh, exhibit four, which is the budget that was in the packet today. Um, and I'm on page 23, looking specifically at 23. Uh, basically, uh, if you go down one, two, three, four lines, you see the uh, Arts Commission at $106,000 with uh, any kind of footnote explaining why it's gone up about 50% from the prior biennium and why and also <coughs> which is particularly interesting because fundamentally the prior biennium doubled from the biennium before that and i think the council needs to know what this is all about yeah sure arts commission funding so that recall the the separate arts commission that comes up with their funding request so that request was all part of the september 20th preliminary budget as well mm -hmm. so that number hasn't hasn't changed since that point in time this was the funding requested by the Arts Commission for increased programming for arts. So there is a variety of arts programming that goes into it. Um, one of the factors that they were consider considering was the addition of Klahani as part of their overall uh, area that they serve and reaching out in those events and activities. So that was the main driver of the uh, professional services line in the, the Arts Commission budget there.
Any other questions? Is the council happy with that? Yeah, we had talked about it. Okay. Uh, the Arts Commission does a great job in the city. I'm not saying they don't. I just mm -hmm. looked at this magnitude of the increase. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilmember Keller. Yeah, this is really more commentary uh, in the in the budget message. I, I think this is where I picked this up uh, was regarding uh, FTEs, and I'm not really talking about the FTEs are being complicated uh, contemplated here in the budget. I'm really interested in. We've used the metric that Sammamish has the lowest. FTEs of our neighboring cities, and you know, you you brought up some of that as we were just going through this. But um, we also are a bedroom community, as compared to the other cities. And I'm just curious if we are looking out forward um, at some of the other services that might be costing us more as we tradition or as we transition to having more commercial in the city, because it's not that far off in the distance. I would say yes, <laughs> we are looking at that. I can point specifically to police services as an area that we'll be studying in 2017. I know our police chief is concerned about uh, the addition of the town center, for example, and how those service needs will change. So uh, respectively, we've, we've looking at all areas of work and, and really tracking how our, our service needs and our resources will likely be changing in time. And I would say that this is a good opportunity for us to have continuing dialogue with council uh, and our citizens and working with expectations that uh, both council and their citizens have going forward. Uh, it, Sammamish is in transition uh, and uh, we're finding that more people do require or do uh, are asking for more services. Uh, and so to the extent that uh, council uh, is interested in that, uh, we will have that dialogue. Great. Looks like we have a few more questions before we go on. Um, Council Member Hornish? Yeah, more commentary as well, but, um, and I think this is a much longer discussion, but just to note, and these are all things that I, all, everything that's put together in this budget, I think is things, are things that Sammamish needs to do and maybe we're doing a little bit of catch up in the 17 and 18 from past years. But given that, it's just to note, we are spending down savings $45 million. Mm -hmm. And we're getting down to 17.4, 17 as you talked about, for the ending fund balance. Longer discussion as to what the outlook is after that, probably a topic for the retreat, but just to highlight it. Mm -hmm. Good point. Deputy Mayor of Eldorama. Further commentary. <laughs> uh, First of all, we are in transition. There are demands for more levels of services in some areas. Last year, we added what, six employees on to full-time employees, brought us up to 93 full-time employees, as I recall. We're, not too many years ago, we were down in the 60s and then jumped to 70s. Now we're talking about 11 more employees, so that's gonna be 104 full-time employees. So understand we're in transition but we are rapidly escalating the numbers of staff here at an unprecedented rate and admittedly we're in transition, but that has to be taken into account. Furthermore, and I was gonna hold it till later, but even as we start to look at this, we have the statement, this ordinance is a declaration of finding of substantial need due to several major upcoming projects and operating costs rising faster than the rate of inflation. Last time we started to talk about the stormwater fee and we need a comprehensive look at that to be able to look, but I think we have to schedule sooner rather than later a greater discussion on how are we going to address the shortfall. We cannot continue to go on without paying our way, which means the property taxes are gonna have to go up. We're gonna have to be looking at utility taxes. We've already even been talking about and citizens have been asking about so getting some debt for construction work that they want us to be proactive about. And so I'd like to see us schedule a time to have that discussion. It's something that's been asked for by citizens since last September, and I think it's well due and coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Odell. Well, Ramiro, I think that's an excellent retreat topic, and uh, it's a discussion we definitely need to have. 
I'm wondering, can we go back to the one bar chart I saw a little bit ago that shows some image compared to our peers? Expenditures. Uh, expenditures. Yeah. Um, going to the question of the fact we're a bedroom community in transition, I'd hesitate to compare us to Bellevue or even Redmond uh, or Issaquah. Or Kirkland. Or Kirkland. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. <laughs> Throw this one out. <laughs> no, I'm wondering, frankly, if the closest comparison we do have today is Mercer Island, uh -huh. given the nature of that community. Yeah. Plus, Mercer Island does have a town center type uh, section to its uh, community. So maybe if we did a dive into Mercer Island uh, compared to us, we might get a glimpse of the future. Thank you. Okay. When, remember, we're twice the size of the impact, more than, or almost three but this times. this is not per capita basis. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Might be interesting to see what Snoqualmie is per capita. Yeah. Oh, good point. Okay, Council Member Huckabee. Uh, yes, uh, I too am concerned about the budget. Uh, and I believe that our citizens are demanding a lot more services, and I'm a little bit concerned that we're we're going to have a lot of this conversation at the retreat, and we may have to make some budget adjustments. Uh, obviously, from my perspective, one of the things that I'm hearing, and I've heard it from some council members, is how do we do and how do we provide some additional transit services, including an internal circulator. And I'm not sure if... Um, Tom or Don paid attention in the email from Bill Bryant. He did tell us what the cost was for the Redmond Loop, mm -hmm. uh, for example. That's $123,000 a year, and it's partnered between Redmond and the um, uh, and Metro. So I'm not sure what Redmond share is, but the Route 200, which is the loop that runs in Issaquah. That costs $435,000. Yeah. That's a big chunk of money. And uh, Issaquah is paying very, very little of it. Metro is carrying most of it, and they're not happy with that and probably will either not continue that service or continue to push back, back against Issaquah. But I think we have to recognize that if we want to do internal circulation, and uh, it just even in the conversation with Bill, it is so difficult uh, because our geography to get people from the plateau. Some may want to go toward, the, especially on the south end, some may want to go toward the highlands, some may want to go toward the um, Isqua Transit Center, and there's no way that you can go to one and the other at the same time. It just, t it's, it's a half an hour, and nobody's gonna do both. So somehow, we're, if we want people to be able to take the bus more often, we're gonna have to somehow bite a bullet at some point uh, along the way and begin to provide more service. And I, I think this is a retreat topic as well. But I do think that as we densify, as we have more traffic, it's an issue we're gonna need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilmember O'Dell. Yeah, Kathy, I, um, I did see that email this afternoon and uh, I found the two numbers very interesting and very different. And <coughs> I, I hope with further conversation with Bill, and by the way, I do have that on my calendar, Mm -hmm. uh, that we can get into what the drivers are for the difference. Yeah. And I, because I, I think we definitely need to understand that. Right, I do too. The, the second thing I would ask, uh, as soon as you've been in contact with Bill, is for him to match the cost numbers up with ridership, because I'm very interested in what the cost per rider is. Yes. Uh, that's a metric that we also mm -hmm. need to look at. Yeah, because the, uh, I understand the 200 is not getting a lot of riders because it doesn't go where it needs to go. Well, that can be part of the discussion, uh, I, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Bill Ramos. He said it doesn't go to Swedish Hospital, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're digressing a little bit I here. I know we are. Um, Councilmember Melcho. I had a question. It was back up on the slide you, we had it before. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so in the parks and recs portion, we look very small, but, um, if you can help define that Issaquah actually provides the recreation portion and we don't, is that a fair 
assessment of why that's so small? Maybe a comparison it, to some other jurisdictions? It's exactly why it's so small. We are not a direct recreation program provider. We contract for those services, or we partner for those services, excuse me. So it looks like it's on par with Kirkland. Does Kirkland function the same way? No, they are a direct provider, and I, I can't speak to why, I, I can't speak to why those, uh, why Kirkland is a little bit smaller. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can move on. You sure? <laughs> okay, so the uh, second item is the property tax, the 2017 levy. We have a first reading and public hearing tonight as well. Just a reminder of the 2016 property tax levy, so the year uh, that we're in right now, our total levy rate, $10.80 per thousand of assessed valuation. And then the, the contributors towards that basically are shown the different entities that uh, share a piece of those collections. The point here is that of the total property tax collections, uh, Sammamish receives 18% of that uh, in the Issaquah School District uh, section of the city. So within Lake Washington, it's the uh, a different levy rate, obviously, for the school. So looking at our 17 property tax calculation, and this is an estimate at this point because it's based on the estimate received from King County Assessor and what our assessed valuation is. So the top number there, 27.8 million, that's our estimated property tax levy amount. The number from the King County, our assessed valuation estimate is 14.4 billion per thousand of assessed valuation. That equates to a rate of $1.93 per thousand. Also noting that this uh, particular uh, action is structured to not take the 1%, and so not taking the 1% is uh, an action that council has foregone for eight years now, uh, since 2010. Also an additional note, the final assessed valuation comes from the King County's uh, uh, assessor's office at the end of November, so we get a final stamp. Of course, we have to submit our rate to them before they give us their final assessed valuation, so there is a timing overlap there. So that's why we're, we're working with estimates here. What was the rate in 2016? 2016 will be coming up, yeah. We've got that in there. We'll have the whole history in there, the whole. So uh, another item that's come up this year, and this comes up from time to time over the years, it's the levy limit itself. Uh, so by statute, uh, the, the limit can increase by 1% or inflation as defined by the implicit price deflator and the increase in the implicit price deflator. That number, the IPD, implicit, implicit price deflator, was 0.953%, so just slightly under the 1%. So what that triggers is an additional action that council would need to take to make the limit 1%. And the only reason we would do that is so that we can bank a full 1%. So that's the... Uh, the difference that's being noted here is we're having to do a, a finding of substantial need to raise it from the 0.953% to a full 1%. And so that would then, the plan here would be to bank that one uh, additional 1%. To simplify the math for the finance department. It will, yes, simplify this going forward. Mm -hmm. So we have a clean 1% uh, add. So that's that particular action. Uh, Historical assessed valuation within the city is shown here all the way back to 2008 <coughs> can show the uh, big increase here uh, or the significant one there in 2016 with the addition of Klahani uh, going from 11.2 to 13.7 and then really the increase from 13.7 to the current estimate from King County of 14.4. Half a million of that is related to new construction coming onto the tax rolls and the remaining portion would be the increase in valuations. So that's what's composing that, that uh, particular in, increase there. Historical levy amounts. So we asked uh, what the previous years were here, and it goes all the way back to 2008. You can show all the levy rate history. It's always been lower than the, the current $1.93 that's estimated. And the amount of revenue shown on the right, uh, increasing from 2008 all the way through the current estimate of $27.7 .7 Yes. Did you do 
your calculation on what the levy rate would be if we took the 1%? No, I didn't. Uh, we can't hear it. It's a small amount of money, so I wouldn't think it would be much, but I... As I far as the total amount of revenue raised, is that what you... No, I'm looking at the levy rate and how that would change if we did take the 1%. Yeah. Okay. I did that in two cents. Twenty-eight. About right. Twenty-eight divided by fourteen point four. One percent of the levy. Two cents. Yeah. Okay. Twenty-eight divided by fourteen point four. Councilmember Hornish. Yeah, I just need some help understanding one thing. Um, in Bill Number Twelve, there's references to twenty-seven point seven budget, and then there's talking about the twenty. 8.5, and is, is the 28.5 the max that we're approving in this ordinance depending on the assessed value? Yes. But we're budgeting 27.7 and then 28.1 for 18 with a total of 55.8, is that correct? Yes. So the budget amounts are gonna lay in, that's what we're expecting to collect from the levy. The 28.5 is our estimate of the levy and that is going to be a, a calculation after we get the final assessed valuation from the county. What, so uh, what's estimate. the 800,000 difference? I don't quite, know, that's where I'm asking. I yeah, guess. so we assume that there's going to be an increase in assessed valuation that we're going to get. It's going to be a higher number than what we currently have in our worksheet that we're going to get as the final. So that's what we're asking for authorization for. And that's, then it, we're hoping to get the 27.7. And that's As what the we're budgeting budget is the 27.7. Seven. Yes. That's what I wanted to just clarify. Yep. Okay, I got it. And at 28.5 is giving you enough room to be able to adjust. Right, and they will lower it if we can't get I it. I got so it. Okay, yeah. just wanted to confirm. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Keep so going. the answer to the question was 1.94. 1.94. <laughs> oh, see, that's... Only one. We said two cents. I did. <laughs> Check them later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, next step will be the second reading. So we have a couple public hearings tonight as well. If there's no further questions. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, then we should go back to item 11 and open a public hearing on it. So item 11 is the first reading of an ordinance declaring a statement of substantial need for the purpose of setting the limit factor related to levying the property tax in 2017. Um, so I will open the public hearing on that. Public hearing is open. I don't have a sheet on that one. Is there anybody that would like to address the council on this? No, nope. seeing none, uh, we'll close the public hearing. You wanna close it or continue it? That, that, one, that, one, that one technically does not require a public hearing. Uh, but right, it was included I was just with the budget leaving items. the opportunity for the public. Okay, so that is closed, and this is a first reading, so no action is required. So then we'll go to item number 12, which is the 2017 property tax levy ordinance. Um, and we have no sign-up sheet for that either, do we, Madam Clerk? Nope. So we'll open the public hearing. Public hearing is open on the first reading of the ordinance for the property tax levy ordinance. Uh, is there any public that would like to, nope, nobody wants to comment on that? Well then, um, are we gonna close that one too? It is, it is yes, a, I would pleasure. go. We, we're recommending okay. closure. But. Okay, public hearing's closed. And uh, for that, that again is um, first reading, so no action at this time. So then we go to item number 13, which is the first reading of an ordinance adopting the city's 2017, 2018 biennial budget. And we do have some people that would like to speak to that. Uh, public hearings open, uh, and Jan Berg, followed by Sarah Baker.
uh, Jan Bird, 3310, 221st Avenue, Southeast. And uh, I strongly agree with our city manager's request for increased staffing. I think probably should have been done a long time ago, and especially since we've gained another 10,000 people, I think it's critical that we do add more staff. We don't want a government that spends money recklessly, but we do need a staff that has the tools not only to get the basics done, but also to look forward and acting proactively rather than reactively. And for example, I just wonder why did it take so many years of residents screaming about trees coming down due to development in order to get some movement on a more robust tree ordinance? And my guess is we just have such a lean staff that uh, the staff are so busy with the basics they couldn't look that far ahead. Uh, when you're swamped taking care of a huge number of development permits, uh, how can you think ahead about better community design, for example? Uh, so, it, one thing I am happy about, I saw in the budget that there's a plan for uh, more code enforcement uh, related to the tree ordinance, and I think a, a lot of us uh, said in the process of doing the tree ordinance that it was sufficiently complex that we really, you couldn't add that duty onto an existing person, and uh, it's good that uh, another person's being added for that. And also, as previously, I support the addition of acquisition money, land acquisition money, in the parks budget. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Sarah Baker. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. My name is Sarah Baker. I'm uh, the Policy Associate with Housing Development Consortium. Um, I know you've received a letter from us, so hopefully none of what I'm about to say is a surprise and you throw tomatoes at me on my way out. I've <laughs> um, heard a lot of good uh, testimony from many of your um, folks tonight, including Michael and Thomas, and I just want to drive home the point again about um, the parity goals for ARCH. Um, let me read from my script here. So HDC is joining with eight other Eastside nonprofits and service providers, including HopeLink and Imagine Housing. Um, others you might be familiar with include Sophia Way, Congregations for the Homeless, YWCA, um, to request the tripling of the parity goals uh, for the 2017-2018 budget cycle. Um, as you know, when the East Side Cities created ARCH, they did so with the intention of working collaboratively um, to ensure that their communities would be places where um, people with special needs, seniors, families um, could all live in a place of dignity, in a safe and healthy, affordable home. So um, over the course of these 25 years since ARCH has developed, um, thousands of homes have been created and they would not otherwise exist. So, um, as you know, the guidelines, the parity goals, um, were established in the 90s and they are woefully out of date. Lots changed in 20 years, as you know. Um, I think Michael and Thomas did a good job kind of underscoring the need. Um, I found the increased rents to be particularly startling and the fact that that's showing up in our rising homelessness population in the school districts um, is alarming as well. So, with that said, we sincerely thank you for your proposed increase to the ARCH fund, um, the Eastside Housing Trust Fund, excuse me, and we urge you to adopt that proposed increase, um, plus whatever. Um, however, we also know that affordable housing crisis isn't going to go away in the next biennium. Um, so to give you perhaps a preview of what the updated parity goals would look like that are more reflective of the need and the cost to develop in your area, um, a triple parity goals for Sammamish would actually be like $1.1 million. Um, so don't expect you to hit that uh, this budget cycle, but if it could be a figure that you could keep in mind for the future and aspire for um, coming bienniums, we'd encourage you to do that. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? Please. My name is Mary Wichter. I live at 408 200 8th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. <clears throat> um, just a couple things on the budget. I understand that we're having money, a lot of money set aside for land acquisition, which I think is a great thing for the city to do because 
you need to try to grab the parcels while you can, and while it's not particularly affordable, if you don't grab them, you'll never get them. I would like to point out, however, particularly since uh, sewer and water districts are in charge of water and sewer and the third wet utility is um, for surface water, which the city owns, it's often as good or better to use just an easement when you're running a utility as to actually purchase land, like I believe the Can you repeat is. that, please? <clears throat> it's often as good to use an easement instead of purchase land for a utility. For example, the water and sewer district does not actually own a bunch of parcels. Mm -hmm. They run water mains and sewer mains through easements that they've acquired through various ways. And I think it's important for the city not to just acquire land, but if you're gonna do connectivity, which has been called a number of things, the non-motorized plan, the trails, bikeways, and pathways plan. If you wanna do that, um, I have spoken at parks meetings and planning commission meetings and other meetings that utility corridors are very important. And a lot of times they have a history that goes back almost to the beginning of the United States and the, the Homestead Act in the, in the 1860s. If you look at things that are on section lines, half section lines, quarter section lines, and quarter quarter section lines, those are great places to run your utilities. So when you're looking at land acquisition, don't forget to look over easements because they are tied to the land, they pass to heirs, successors, and assigns, and they can be very useful and the water district uses them a lot. The second item I have is actually a question. As you know, I live in Tamarack, <clears throat> and I, I believe when the budget is done, if you think or know that you're getting grants, that money is not put in. And I know recently a couple grants were gotten with related to stormwater, and I don't believe those numbers have been added in. But in Tamarack, you've had multiple feedback from people on why a lid won't work, why it won't pass, why it isn't reasonable, why it isn't fair. I think it will take way too long. And since the city's put development there, um, we just don't think that it's reasonable to go through that as an access. But you've put, I believe, $565,500 in as a contribution from Tamarack, well, I don't believe there's any possibility of that actually happening. So I don't know what to do to work on that if someone could get back to me on that because if you're not putting in grants and stuff you've already gotten, why would you put in this money that you would have to go through a heck of a lot of process time and effort to get, which we don't, we've given you feedback saying we don't think that that will happen. So if someone could answer that or get back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Mary. Is there anybody else that would like to comment? No? Then we'll continue the uh, public hearing on this until the 15th. Okay. Any other comments from council? Nope, your time's up. Yep, we're done. <laughs> Keep the show on the board. Okay, we have no unfinished business. We do have some new business. Discussion. Uh, the pro plan update scope of work. Mr. City Manager. Uh, yes, we, uh, we have our uh, Parks Director, Angie Fesser, here. Uh, basically what we're gonna do is limit the scope or, or limit the conversation tonight to discussing the scope uh, of the new uh, work to be done during the new uh, pro plan. So with that, I will turn things over to Angie Fesser. Usually it's the other way around, I'm told to be quiet, so <laughs> very rarely am I told to speak up. So um, we're gonna review the scope of work for the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Plan update. And there's gonna be a couple pieces we're gonna go through tonight, but I just wanna focus primarily on the scope for the proposed work that's coming. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. So we're gonna talk about the existing pro plan that we have in place talk a little bit about the proposed scope of work and then have a discussion about that with you and get your feedback and input on that. So a couple key points I wanna hit on though before we get into this is that we will also be running some plans concurrently to this. So currently the land acquisition strategy plan and policy is in motion and has started work. It's very similar in some ways to the work that we're doing in that it is um, looking at um, an inventory of what we do have for parks land, kind of compared against the, the priorities that we wanna have and the gap between those two. 
So that plan is running concurrently. We're right behind that, and we're gonna share some pieces of that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. The urban forestry plan, as you saw, will um, start mid-year this year. We have some overlapping pieces with that. And the transportation plan also ties in um, with the work we'll be doing with the pro plan when it comes to talking about trails and corridors and regional linkages of trail systems. This is a customarily six-year update, um, and it's required for grant funding eligibility. So in the parks world, um, there's one primary source of significant grant funding, and it's called RCO, the Recreation and Conservation Office, and it's run through the state of Washington. It's primarily the large dollar grants from the state and federal. So in order to be eligible for that funding cycle, we have to be current on our pro plan. This plan update will be due by the end of February of 2018 in order for us to be eligible for that funding cycle. If we do not make that deadline, we won't be eligible for grant funding cycle until 2020. So it's really important that we keep that timeline <clears throat> in mind. It seems like it's a long ways away, but we all know that goes really pretty quickly, actually, when you get into these large planning projects. So the current plan that we have was adopted in 2012. It serves as a guiding document for the parks and recreation programming and our recreation facilities. And it's also supportive of and part of the city's comprehensive plan. These are kind of the major components within the existing plan that we do have. The basics starts with the community profile, our demographics, our regional resources, and the characteristics of our community. Inventory, level of service, and analysis of our facilities, of parks, athletic fields, and the specialized recreation facilities. It also covers an inventory and needs assessment for the recreation programming that we offer, as well as the cultural arts provided by Sammamish. It also looks at and examines opportunities and the um, trends and the partnerships that we have for our volunteers. We have a very substantial volunteer program here as well as our community partners that we have programs through. And then of course there's always kind of the, once you figure it out, how do you do it? And that's the implementation of the processes and projects and of course importantly the funding strategies that we have. So that's the current um, pro plan components. So now I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about our proposed scope of work um, and how that's a little bit different than our existing plan. So the first plan that was done in 2012 was really substantial, but now's our opportunity to kind of go back that we've used it for a number of years. How can we um, change the scope of it? What are we really after looking at right now? What are our needs? We can kind of fine tune that a little bit more. So in the new uh, plan, we're gonna be looking at updating obviously our community profile with the annexation of um, uh, Klahani that's changed our demographics a little bit, looking at our existing parks, fields, and recreation facilities, obviously with annexation. Um, we have a new building right over here, the community center, that changes things as well. That's all happened since this plan was done. And of course, updating the goals and objectives within the plan. An additional inventory, I think this is an area that we can expand a little bit um, in, in cover that's important from what I've been hearing from the last, since the two months that I've been here. And that's getting into a little bit more of the natural areas and green spaces that all tie together in what we call a green infrastructure. So it looks at wetlands and streams and ravines and natural features that all work together. We don't necessarily isolate them, but they're combined systems. And then also looking a little bit harder at trail linkages and corridors not only within our parks, but between our parks and regionally and connecting important uh, elements and destinations within our communities. Now this is kind of also expanding because of the non-motorized plan that's been um, taken off the drawing board in essence. So this is an area to, to cover that um, in conjunction with the transportation plan. We're also gonna um, obviously look at our existing programming for recreation and our special and community events our cultural arts programs, our volunteers that we're working with, and our existing <clears throat> community partnerships. What are we doing? What are we doing well? And where can we expand and how to do that? <coughs> Within this scope of work too, we're also going to um, have a valid, uh, statistically valid survey. 
But because the land acquisition strategy is happening at the same time and also doing a statistically valid survey, a lot of these components overlap. So what we've done, we're deciding to, the approach we're gonna take is to do a, a survey for both of them that works for both. There are obviously some common areas, but then we'll have some components of the surveys that tailor right to those two plans. But we'll be running the survey almost at the same time anyway, and um, we're gonna tailor it to work for both of these plans. We're also gonna update within the, this pros plan the, um, the capital facilities plan, the CIP, and um, have more information for that and make that more current. That also overlaps obviously with the land acquisition plan that we're doing. And then of course we'll round it out with our implementation strategies at the end um, of how to implement what we've come up with. And of course a big component of this is our public process and a public outreach and community engagement. And we're, um, some of the things that we're proposing to do here, obviously the public meetings and open houses, using our social media um, channels, the virtual town hall is a great format to work, being president at public events, having a booth at the farmer's markets that are special events, having public input that way, and of course the public opportunity during the Parks and Recreation and Planning Commission meetings, as well as at the city council meetings. So that's kind of the overview that the long term or the, the process throughout the project that we're gonna involve the community. And we're also open to more suggestions, obviously. So the next steps in the schedule, um, kind of the work we're right doing right now is uh, the scope of work, the RFQ and getting the consultant on board, hoping to bring that to you um, in January for the contract review and then the project starts and runs through the, you know, the 2017. And then again, the most important part there is the deadline of adoption of late February, trying to catch that March 1 deadline with the state of Washington. So that kind of concludes the, the presentation here about the proposed scope of work, and I would really like to hear your input and answer any questions you may have. Council Member Hornish. I'm not sure I have anything specific, but had, did, were there other pieces of the study that you considered and rejected that you didn't put in <coughs> this scope? Uh, no. Is there, anything, is there anything else that you think that, that, you, that you consider to be done? No. Okay. No. It's very thorough. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Valderrama. And I guess, and I'm glad you pointed out, Angie, that this is being done in conjunction with the other two, the land acquisitions and that, and something that I've harped upon for a while is a visualization. I mean, not just the words that we need healthy, recreational, but how is this city going to look in the next 30 years? What's it looking like? I'm concerned and many citizens are concerned that we're losing our city our city day by day as projects go on. As far as parks go, as I remember our last uh, pro plan, it said that with the possible exception which was debated of the northeast corner, we didn't need any more parks. We had passed the different metrics that of cities and there was the one of the distance, I believe that the northeast quadrant still existed under. If that's the case still, uh, because we still have to look at what Klahani has to do with that one park, then the emphasis I would see being on the trails, athletic fields and things of that nature which we should specifically focus and make sure that we're addressing that and when talking about the parks for the city, emphasize it more from the level of service because not all parks should be treated the same way nor are they being utilized the same and right size those uh, parks. So I'd like to see that there is that right sizing of this plan, I'd like to see a much more visualization and, and we had asked the same thing of the planning commission, the urban forestry management that they also combine in the work that they're doing here because we're losing with the opportunities, major uh, projects that are going on for roads, whether it's Sahali, whether it's Issaquah, uh, Fall City or Pine Lakes that we look at what can we do as far as the tree canopy? Do we want trees that are overlapped? Do we want them to have plum trees, cherry trees, et cetera? But if we don't start planning that and coordinating, I think this is an opportunity to be able to look at that. And so I'd ask that that be looked at and not spend as much time asking people, do you want more parks when at least we've passed it on all the metrics 
and let's put it where we could um, more effectively utilize it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Huckabee. Curious how, uh, when we had our conversation with Central Washington, uh, if that does come to fruition, which would be wonderful, they'll be able to offer us quite a bit in terms of the cultural arts. So how in this questionnaire are we going to survey people to talk about the desire for and how we uh, access uh, cultural arts? in such a way that we're not making a commitment that we're either going to provide more or that we're going to partner with somebody. And I, I do think there's gonna be a tremendous opportunity to partner. So I, I'm a little concerned about how you're going to broach that question. The other question that I don't really see on here is uh, beachfront. Uh, how, do we pr how do we talk to people about additional acquisition of land or development of land, such as a, the Beaver Lake, for example, <coughs> so that there are more swimming beaches in the area. Mm -hmm. And we talk, about rec we talk about recreational fields and athletic fields, <coughs> but we don't talk about if the top priority is an additional beach on Lake Sammamish, uh, how do we identify that in this, in this process? Right. And that is going to kind of come through. Uh, I think the, the survey is a good way to do that, but we have other methods. And it's, it's the work we're trying to do is to find the priorities of the community. Right. What do they want, both programming and facility-wise? So um, through that process, I think those priorities kind of float to the surface. You know, they work their way to the top. And so, um, but we don't necessarily frame the question, would you rather have you know, an athletic field or uh, a trail. We can ask more open-ended questions that say, you know, what you would prefer so that, you know, if, if waterfront is the priority of the community or the trails are the priority of the community, those are gonna work their way forward. So uh, we, we use a professional survey company to help us craft our questions uh, in, in exploring what those needs are and the priorities of the community. So. Will we have an opportunity to see those? Yes, okay. we can do that. Councilmember O'Dell. Thank you. I have not so much a question as kind of a request, and uh, maybe it's a suggestion. Um, a couple of meetings ago, we had a young lady uh, come testify in favor of replacing the Zaccuse Creek culvert. Her name, I believe, is McKenna Dorman, and she's a member of the Snoqualmie tribe. Right. And uh, I think uh, one of the things I would like to ask that be taken into account somehow in the pro plan is that we look back into the history of this area, and particularly the Native American history, because the, the film that, uh, or the slideshow she had, to me was very, very powerful in terms of uh, talking about what Sammamish has been, what the basis for, what we are today is. And I, I hope that's included somehow. Thank you. Good comment. Councilmember Melchow. Thank you. Um, I assume this will help us to identify gaps from within Sammamish. I know it says community profile. I'm assuming that when we look out at like the 244th area, we're there's a void for parks, open space, whatever, up that way. So it will help identify areas of our city that are in need. Is that correct? Assumption? Yeah, geographic distribution is definitely one of the, the ways to filter okay. the needs. Yeah. Thanks. Councilmember Keller. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, you were surprised not very long ago when um, I think it was Isqua School District uh, is now evaluating their schedule uh, and the shared field that we have been maintaining and investing in may not be available to us as long as it was in the past possibly because of the uh, change in schedule. I'm not saying that that is going to happen. I'm just saying that there's an exposure there uh, that I'm wondering if we need to be looking at contingencies in the future to make sure that we actually have control more if we're not just at you know, that, 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 
That's yeah, Jesse's coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Jesse answer this, but uh, we're, we're actually in process uh, to come back to council next week with further explanation, so. Absolutely, I was just going to point out, we've uh, added an item to your agenda next week that uh, will bring forth the contract for the Skyline turf replacement. And part of that is also, um, and I will tell you now, a, a shared costs with the Issaquah School District. But we've realized the high school fields, there's a lot of variability with high school scheduling, and there may be other better opportunities within either of the school districts to partner on fields that, that would provide us with more hours and a little more flexibility. Um, we have Inglewood Junior High on our list, and, and we have a number of other properties that Issaquah has brought forward. So that will all be part of this plan and something we are very eager to look at. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Any other comments or questions on the scope? No, very good. Thank you, Ann. Like thank you. Mm -hmm. Also. Okay, it's uh, council reports and council committee reports. And usually we start with Bob, but yep. we'll start with- second, You second can start with me. <laughs> I, I actually have no report this evening. Ooh, Ooh. Uh, Christy. Um, so the outcomes tab for the virtual town hall on growth will be updated here shortly if it hasn't already been. So um, folks in the community can look back on that virtual town hall link and find out kind of what we're doing with that information. Um, and for those that haven't visited the new city website, it is now up. Um, there are some, we're still migrating data over, so there are some hiccups that we're identifying. Um, certainly appreciate the community's feedback in identifying some of those, but we are working through that. So patience with us as we work through it, but the new site looks great. Great. Council Member Huckabee. Uh, yes, thank you. <coughs> as you know, uh, I received an email. Uh, it came to me, but it was really intended for the entire council. And it was the notification that there was uh, a change in, there was an addition to the King County budget for the 2017-18 biennium. And that budget uh, calls for uh, three additional routes of the uh, 216 bus, which will be during um, commute hours. And that will start uh, the next change in service, which I think is February or March of 2017. The other uh, increase was a all day service on the Route 269. And this was primarily on the south end. Currently, the 269 runs this, there are two buses. It's a large loop. One starts up at Overdale Park and Ride, and it runs through the city, and it goes down to Issaquah Highlands, comes down and around, goes by Costco, and then around to the transit center. Uh, and then there's one starting at the transit center and makes the backward loop. So it's a crazy loop. So when I saw that, I had the suspicion that that might be the case that they were going to continue. So I put a packet together and went down and talked with the uh, Bill uh, Bryant, the service manager, whose first comment to me is, why didn't you talk to us before? <laughs> and I said, well, we have, and I Fired. have this letter that said that you weren't gonna provide us more service. He said, well, you're talking to the wrong people. So I just kind of shook my head and uh, just kind of moved on with it. But I did uh, explain to him that, the, and I, I took timetables and I took the map and took other information of, of the number of people that are working in the Isqua area, the number of people that are working at Costco, and explained that their purpose is to get additional service both to the community and to increase the utilization of the South Sammamish Park and Ride. So when you think about somebody like myself who might want to walk to the South Sammamish Park and Ride to go to Seattle, I would have to get on the 269 and precisely, if traffic is good, 25 minutes later, I'm at the uh, Issaquah Transit Center to board a bus that will take me to Seattle. I can get down there in six minutes by car. So the likelihood of doing that. So the more we talked about it, the more he recognized that this probably needed some relook. And so he will be coming out on November 10th to look at the community and the geography. Now, the issue is <laughs> nothing is easy with the county. 
If the route were to change, for example, to go from the South Sammamish Park and Ride directly to the Issaquah Transit Center versus the crazy route they're currently doing, it will not only have to go back to the King County uh, Council for a budget amendment, but they will have to hold a public process. Oh, <laughs> because the bus, the, um, we've no, they'd no longer be pro providing service to people along the Issaquah uh, Pine Lake Road. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an easy, well, we'll just change it. So we'll see. Uh, I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. I'm curious to hear uh, what he says. He seems to be very interested in providing a better level of service to us <coughs> and our geography is challenging, so it'll be interesting. So I understand that Tom O'Dell will be at that meeting and we'll, we'll tour him around like we did uh, uh, Carol and Stephen, and uh, we'll see what results. So I've also invited Cheryl if she's free, but okay, we'll see. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, so for clarification, it's to be determined about mm -hmm. Speaking route. the mic. I'm sorry, thank you. It's to be determined if the route will change, but are we going to start getting all day service as it stands? We will get all day service starting in September of 2017. The question is the route, and I did show him that um, we do have a bus pull-off there that is no longer being used, and the bus shelter is no longer being used, and we'd li really like to understand what their proposals are so that we can make sure that we're designing the road in accordance with that. Well, I, I would like to thank you for your efforts. If that's the uh, result that we're getting, uh, I know, Kathy, you've been involved in a long time in the Transportation Committee with... Uh, Mayor Jaron and Council Member Odell, thank you very much for your hard work. If that's the case, you're gonna make a lot of people in Sammamish happy if we that route starts. Thank you, we'll see. You bet. <clears throat> thank you, Kathy. Tom? Uh, real quick, the only meeting that I've done <coughs> over the past couple weeks was with Imagine Housing that we've heard from uh, a couple times tonight. I just wanna emphasize their recommendation is to triple it, which when we try to understand where they're coming up with that, I'm not sure the rationale is there to support the tripling, and we are focused, and just to emphasize the point again, we're focused on what ARCH is gonna come up with and then what we've discussed before as far as the parity and the total amount and the fee waiver. So, okay. just to emphasize. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. I wanna thank Hornish for working on that and putting that into perspective and balance. Uh, we've just finished Nightmare at Beaver Lake. <laughs> So that's come to a close. That's the number one tourist attraction for the city of Sammamish year after year. Despite being closed for the first weekend, their numbers did rebound. Uh, so while it'll be less than last year, it won't be that far less than last year despite that weekend, thank goodness, because that 100,000 plus dollars goes directly into charities here locally, which helps <coughs> augment and supplement our own efforts in uh, human services. Thank you. So our number one attraction is a nightmare. That's correct. <laughs> Seeing this council is quite fitting. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought for sure it would be late night city council meetings. But yeah. <laughs> up there, I guess the it's not that. <laughs> council member Odell. I can see the headline now, Nightmare City. <laughs> okay, uh, I have about three or four things. Uh, first of all, uh, the Transportation Committee had a meeting on October 19th to talk about uh, the status of a couple of our projects. We talked about Issaquah Falls City. Uh, a lot of the problems there are being worked out uh, with the local residents, including the church. And uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, Sahali Way and uh, what we may or may not do there. That evening on the 19th, we had uh, another Sahali Way open house at the uh, Boys and Girls Club. We had about 100 people in attendance, many of whom had been there before. We heard uh, a number of the same things. Uh, keep the trees, um, make it anywhere from uh, two lanes to five lanes. Uh, the uh, results were kind of uh, all over the map. And Steve, I don't know how you're coming on collating all the results of that, but I'm hoping that uh, we have uh, a view of that in our next uh, Transportation Committee meeting, which is on November 3rd. Uh, 
I had the uh, pleasure and privilege of attending the joint board meeting with Central Washington uh, when they were here, our board of trustees, and the council met together. Uh, what we heard was very interesting. Uh, we have received a letter from Central that basically uh, confirms uh, their interest, but uh, the fine details are still to be worked out. Uh, I understand there will be a meeting uh, of the people, Don uh, Ramiro and myself, and uh, Lyman uh, later this week to talk further about that. The Kokanee Work Group uh, met at, uh, actually right here in this uh, room on October 26th. A number of things talked about, status of uh, the uh, habitat restoration on Zacchaeus Creek, uh, a lot of discussion about uh, what we do and do not do for the next Kokanee Refrigerator release. One thing that will be uh, changed is to severely limit the talking of local electric. So Don, <laughs> you're gonna get probably about <coughs> 30 seconds. If that. If that, yeah. <laughs> Another, the last thing I wanna talk about is Eastside Transportation Partnership. Uh, we had uh, <coughs> Congressman Del Benny in attendance and she gave us a uh, rundown on the federal transportation financial situation, which is interesting. Uh, we also had Paul Parker from Washington Transportation Commission there who uh, <coughs> uh, gave a uh, presentation on the road usage charge assessment uh, program for Washington State, and Don, I've got the copy for you. But uh, basically, it's probably nothing new to Don, but for the rest of us, the um, fact is the gasoline taxes are becoming less and less of a factor in uh, uh, replenishing the highway maintenance fund or actual highway building fund, too. So we're going to have to look for something else, and uh, the road usage charge, otherwise known as vehicle miles traveled, uh, could be one of the answers. And uh, the, uh, that was a very interesting thing. I do have a, uh, I have the pleasure of being the ETP legislative chair this year. We've been going back and forth for a number of weeks on the legislative statement. I've got uh, the th thing fairly well under control except for uh, SR 520202 and East Hudson Manage Parkway where we did have uh, come apart with the Redmond Council members on that one. Uh, I did go back and look at the tape of our joint meeting with Redmond, and it was discussed, even though they claimed they never heard it before. And also, uh, Redmond was invited to be a part of the uh, legislative <coughs> committee. And so far, they have not chosen to not participate. But I'm hoping to get back together with uh, our good friends in Redmond between now and the time we, we have our next meeting. I will be running the Where We Are with the statement past Judy Cliburn uh, later this week so you can get her reaction to it as well. And that's my report. Good. Thank you. Uh, being the city's representative on that road usage charge steering committee, uh, I'm going to have an all, all day meeting next week. We're, we're gearing up for the pilot program. On that. I did meet today at the, in actually up at the golf course in Kenmore again. Uh, the North. Tough duty, tough duty done. <laughs> yes, the <laughs> North End mayors met. And <clears throat> a couple, excuse me, a couple of interesting things. Bernie Talmadge from Woodenville mentioned that they have in downtown Woodenville, I haven't seen it yet, uh, 950 unit project under construction. Um, the first phase is open. Bedroom one bed rentals, one bedrooms at a fifteen fifty a, a month, and two bedrooms at twenty two hundred dollars a month, which kind of goes in with what we heard yep. earlier. Um, will cost? No. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one other interesting fact: um, Kenmore has a project that the developers working on right down by the waterfront, mm -hmm. where they've been working on the, the pontoons. Um, it is going to be 2,000 dwelling units and 500,000 square feet of commercial. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like our town center? Oh, very familiar. And this is for a smaller community. Um, and um, I'd hate to see what the, the traffic impacts are on the, 
Five twenty-two. Yes, sir. So that was all very interesting. Several cities are having levies uh, or bond issues on the on the uh, uh, ballot this this coming week, and uh, some of them are uh, up to well, one is thirty-two cents per thousand in Kenmore, another one was fifty cents a thousand in Bothell. Wow. Uh, these are significant uh, mm -hmm. significant levies. And yet one other thing about Kenmore, David Baker mentioned that basically 100% of the property tax is used for law and justice. And that's not counting fire. 100% of their property tax is, is the, the budget for law and justice. Well, you know, that Pierce's County had their, their tax was close to about 90%. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing to me. And ours, um, let's see, I'm not sure what ours is. Um, the sheriff tax, plus uh, uh, probably it's probably about a quarter, yeah. about a quarter, yeah. So there's around a quarter too. Yeah. So a lot of the cities are having to go to special levies, uh, and they're taking their one percent. So that's my report, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have two brief items. One is a reminder that next week, uh, th or excuse me, yes, next week the meeting starts at five o'clock. And it is election night, and so we'll try to get everybody out uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, but it's also, also dependent on uh, <coughs> council. Uh, staff will do it their best. Uh, also then on a calendaring item, uh, I would like to discuss or propose to you that uh, the December 13th meeting, uh, which is turned from a study session to a special meeting, uh, would be the last meeting of 2016. Okay. Uh, but I Do we have to, head nods on that? Yeah. Yes. Head is nodding. Bobbling head. <laughs> for 13th would be the last council meeting of 2016. Good, great. Very good. That is the end of my city manager report. I like that report. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, New Jersey has raised their gas tax by 35 cents. And right. During their conversation, they were talking about how the state's all across the nation um, has not getting enough money out of the gas tax anymore and are searching for other options. But New Jersey is known across the East Coast as the lowest. We would always oh, fill up on the way through. <laughs> well, that's going to go, go away now. They're going to yeah. be very near the high, highest, yeah. still below us. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Right. They don't have any gas to tax for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, we now have an executive session. We have potential property acquisition pursuant to RCW 4231101B and potential litigation pursuant to RCW 4231101I. And how long do we have? Uh, we're anticipating 20 minutes, right. and uh, you may take action. 20 minutes, and we may take action after. All right. Okay, we're back in session. Back in. <coughs> we're back in session. Is there any other uh, for the good of the order or action? Seeing none, I'd take a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, I think, I think that was seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> we are adjourned.